Okay, so I want to uh, convene the regular Fairfax Town Council meeting, Wednesday, June 3rd, 2015, convening at about 7.05 p.m., Fairfax Women's Club. And we preceded this by a special meeting in closed session. I want to report out that the council unanimously approved the application for an industrial disability leave and the resolution in support of it uh, for one of our um, police officer, Mark Howlett. So with that, I have nothing else to report out on closed session. And I'd like a roll call, please. Council Member Weinsoff. Uh, here. Council Member Reed. Here. Vice Mayor Goddard. I'm here. Council Member Lax. Here. Mayor Kohler. Here. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, as far as the approval of the agenda, I want to make a couple of changes to the agenda. I'd like to move the presentation of the plaque honoring the contributions and service of the Rosie the Riveters to be before open time. I'd also like to move the resolution that supports that out of the consent calendar to the presentation. And otherwise, we can discuss consent calendar when it comes up. So any other changes to the agenda? No. Okay, seeing none. I guess I'll I did this. Approval. Uh, second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. I guess I did this a little out of order, but someday I'll get in the right order. So the meeting protocol, the mayor shall maintain order at the meetings in accordance with the Roberts Rules of Order. And the council has the responsibility to be a model of respectful behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at council meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. Please turn off all cell phones or place in silent mode. We'll review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items, if any, can be continued to another meeting. And I'll do the announcements, then we'll do the presentations. Uh, presentation. So announcements, Fairfax Food Pantry, uh, Saturdays 9 to 1 at the Fairfax Community Church, 2398 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Volunteers are always needed. This is a great place if any of you or any of your neighbors uh, need food. There's no requirement to show any proof of need. Um, it's a wonderful thing, so please go and also volunteer if you have time. Uh, public workshop and update to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan will be Saturday, June 6, 10 to 12 at Drake High. The Fairfax Festival is coming up June 13th and 14th with the parade in the morning on the 13th. So we have a number of vacancies on boards and commissions. And I would want to just remind folks who are being considered for planning commission that there's a number of uh, vacancies available to volunteer in town if you're not selected. So two on Parks and Rec Committee, one on the Open Space Committee, and I think another one soon to come. Somebody has just um, submitted a resignation. So there'll be two on Open Space one on the volunteer board, two on the tree committee, and up to six on the new bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee with a deadline of June 15th. Applications are available at town hall and online at our website. And chipper days. We have chipper days, 9 to 3 p.m. So there's going to be several locations in town, June 27th at Dog Egger Park, and that'll be from 9 to 3 p.m. This is for the Cascades neighborhood. 
Um, okay, I'm getting a little confused. I have too many things in front of me. And then July 11th, 9 to 3, at the, for the Scenic Neighborhood at Olima and Sir Francis Drake. Saturday, August 15th, 9 to 3 p.m., for the Jolly Hill Neighborhood at the Pavilion Parking Lot. And Saturday, September 26th, 9 to 3 p.m., at the Deer Park Neighborhood. And that's the Deer Park Parking Lot. And this location is pending some approval by the Water uh, District. So check our town website for details. Uh, we'll have a flyer, I guess, posted on our website. And one of the things, um, there may be people that you know in these neighborhoods that don't have an ability to get uh, things to the chipper locations. If you have a truck or know folks that do, you can assist. Jim, did you want to add something? After you're done. Okay. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. And this is a new opportunity to try to reach more of the neighborhoods this way. And May I add, Mayor? Yes. Um, if you are in a position or had, know somebody who's elderly has, has a need for somebody with a truck to help get stuff down to this chipper day, please let the volunteer coordinator know. Read this one. Or somebody at the town, but you know, that's uh, four, five, six, five, two, five, four, I think is your number. Um, just you know, so that we can get some help because basically we're all in it together in a wildfire. Thank you. Okay, and then I think Renee has an additional one to read from Marin Sanitary. Um, yeah, this was just handed to me, and I'm really happy to know that Marin Sanitary is doing more things than we even know they're doing. The programs and services have really bumped up, um, and this is brand new, and it says, did you know that Fairfax residents are allowed to set out an additional five 32-gallon containers of yard waste each week with their green carts? So just uh, get all that stuff out of there. All that green waste can go out to the curb and they will pick it up. And the good news is that it is now uh, in the final stages of being finalized that it will not be going anymore to Zamora, which is in, in Yolo County, but to Redwood Landfill in their composting program here in Novato. Um, so put out your green waste. They, they want everything to be in their green carts, and that's because they have an automatic system so that the haulers and the drivers don't have to lift and put their bodies at risk. So use the official Marin Sanitary green cart, please. Okay, Thank you. okay and David had another announcement, please. Your Mayor, coming out of the uh, conversation that we had on the, uh, the housing element the other week, uh, some folks in the community were, I think, rightfully confused, because it's tough to figure out um, all of these numbers that are coming down from the state. And uh, but fortunately, Jim Moore, uh, just uh, today, yesterday, put together a really good uh, page and a half memorandum. Um, and thank you very much for doing that. That really um, sort of delves into the details and I think explains it in about as human terms as you possibly can, considering the confusion of it. And we've brought uh, 25 copies of the memorandum uh, if folks would like to have a copy of it to take away. Other than that, I'm sure uh, that we'll put it online. And all of us have received a PDF copy of it, so if folks uh, want to contact any of us to ask us just to forward this thing on as, uh, as an attachment to an email, we can do that as well. But Jim, on behalf of a grateful community, thanks for taking the time out of a busy week. Do you want to hit the main points? The main question from folks was about this confusion between how many numbers and where did the numbers come from? Um, and what Jim has rightfully done by distilling this down is the question of what the state has done is, is impose housing units upon us on a year or a cyclical basis. And some of those units fade away over time if you don't meet them, others of them still uh, survive. Uh, what Jim has done is go through and actually nicely chart out at the very bottom exactly what's called the cycle four from 2007 to 2014 and cycle five, which is 2015 to 2023, and describe exactly how many units we must plan for. And there is some confusion about the total numbers. As Jim rightfully points out, in our current cycle, we have 61 units to plan for. 
but because we did not plan fully for the prior cycle, which ended in 2014, we carry forward 108 units. If you add the 108 and the 61, then you get the 169 units that seems to be causing uh, the concern and the um, misunderstanding, perhaps, in the community. Um, this is all laid out in, um, I, I think, very readable form by Jim. And uh, we, we raised and discussed the issue um, comprehensively during the meeting uh, a week ago. Uh, but to see it in print and to be able to read his very clear uh, explanation, I think, is invaluable to the community uh, as it tries to digest this, this very confusing part of state law. So again, we have copies here today. We're going to put it on the website. And um, all of the council members have, and the clerk, I'm sure, has received it in PDF form, and we can simply um, send that out to you at your request. Please do contact us. I think this will, um, distills nicely, and will helpful, I have a great hope that it might just explain and, and erase some confusion. Thanks again. Okay, thank you, David. So with that, um, we're Madam, gonna- Madam Mayor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, Jim. You can had I another just, one? Yeah, can I just add to your statement about the bike and pedestrian master plan update? Um, as you mentioned, there's a kickoff existing conditions meeting at Drake High School uh, day on Saturday morning, this coming Saturday from 10 to 12. And we'd love folks to show up to look at what had been planned previously, what the existing situation is with what's happened since the last plan, and also put in their two cents worth on what they'd like to see in terms of improvements in pedestrian and bicycle activity in town. I just wanted to punch out that on the town's website this week and next for a week after the meeting on Saturday is a survey that if folks can't make it, or even if they make it and they have some follow-up thoughts, please go to the townoffairfacts.org and participate in the survey, because that will help the consultants that are under the direction of Transportation Authority of Marin um, understand where the town would like to go. So thank you. Yes, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I have to, uh, to uh, tell you guys that uh, what I just shared with you was not correct. How often do council members say that? So um, I just saw this for the first time. So scratch everything I said about your green cards because what they are saying is that there are new 32 gallon sized green waste carts, which I personally only saw for the first time again today down by the coffee roastery. Um, you can, for a very small fee, get four additional carts, in which case you can put five carts of green waste down and mixed with food waste down on your curbside and they will collect it. There is a, a fee for those carts. It's not huge, but please go on their website and get all the information. I will clarify and bring it back to you, but I just wanted you to know that you can erase what I said before. Um, and, but definitely use your green carts and make sure all your food goes in there. Please, thanks. Okay. Mayor. Okay, let's okay. move it along, please. Well, <laughs> not to be more confusing, but I think what you announced earlier, Renee, is true that you don't have to use those green carts. You can put your yard waste out using trash cans. You okay. can, five cans. Okay. We're gonna clarify all this and we're gonna bring it back to you. I mean, okay? that's been the case and for a number of years. Sustainable Fairfax will have really clear information on our website. Okay, we right? will. Okay. But we'll, it has been the case for John. Years. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's wrap it up. So um, we have a couple of things, and uh, Michael, you came in a little late, so I want to point out that the presentation and the appointments are going to go before open time, so I think you're standing there for open time, but okay, well, we're doing it, excuse me, we're starting, I'm just trying to be courteous. So first, I'd like to say we're honored again to have Phyllis Gold with us. Phyll Phyllis, you don't have to stand up yet, but Phyllis is our Rosie the Riveter from Fairfax, and she's become a great friend of mine, and she's done amazing things. And one of Phyllis's dreams is uh, to have a plaque at the World War II Memorial for the Rosies, an additional plaque, and also to have plaques in all cities and towns across the country honoring the Rosies. So, we started it, and I'm very glad to say Supervisor Rice is also here today to add to this. So, Phyllis, we'll have you stand up in a little bit, but I just want to, you don't need to stand through this whole thing. I want to go ahead and read the resolution that we'll, we'll vote on. 
And then I'll also read the plaque, and the plaque will be installed here in the women's club, and we'll have to decide a great location for it. So the resolution, and please bear with me, is it's a resolution of the town of Fairfax honoring the contributions and service of Rosie the Riveters with special recognition for Phyllis Gould of Fairfax, who served at the Kaiser Shipyards in Richmond, California during World War II. Whereas in 1942, during World War II, the United States government launched a campaign to encourage women to enter the workforce to support the war efforts. And whereas the government created and promoted the character, Rosie the Riveter, for the campaign, an image which has become a cultural icon that symbolizes the American women who worked in factories during World War II, many of whom produced munitions and war supplies. And whereas these women often took the place of men in the workforce, replacing male workers who were in the military, and whereas Rosie the Riveter inspired a social movement that increased the number of working women from 12 million to 20 million by 1944, and whereas the image of Rosie the Riveter reflected the work of female welders, riveters and other related industrial professions during World War II, and whereas many of the Rosies in the Bay Area worked at the Kaiser Shipyards in Richmond, California, serving as welders, electricians, draftmen, and in other jobs previously held only by men, and these women proved that they could do a man's job and do it well. And whereas our Rosie of Fairfax, Miss, Mrs. Felix Gould, worked at the Kaiser Shipyards as a welder, and whereas these women broke gender and union barriers to serve their country and laid the foundation for future generations of women in the workforce today, also receiving equal pay for equal work, and whereas the Rosie serve as an inspiration to women and girls today. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town council of the town of Fairfax hereby declares that all the Rosie the Riveters and our Rosie of Fairfax, Mrs. Phyllis Gould, sorry, deserve our sincere gratitude and thanks for their extraordinary work to support the war efforts and pave the way for future generations of women entering the workforce. And be it further resolved that the town council of the town of Fairfax hereby declares that a plaque shall be installed in their honor in our women's club to serve as a memorialization of their achievements in gender equity and pay, their patriotism, and to ensure that future generations will not forget their extraordinary sacrifices and service to our country. The foregoing resolution was adopted in a regular meeting of the town council of the town of Fairfax held in said town on the third day of June 2015 by the following votes, and we'll get to the votes later. But I want to read the plaque, and then I'll come down and, Fair, you, Rose, um, Phyllis, you don't get to keep it, but we'll show it to you. So the plaque says, and actually Phyllis and I worked on the language together, and then I'll call Katie Rice up, who also has things to present. Honoring the Rosie the Riveters, they worked and sacrificed to strengthen our country during World War II and paved the way for future generations of women entering the workforce. Special commendations for Phyllis Gould, our Rosie of Fairfax, Fairfax Town Council 2015. So I'll come down and show it and maybe we can do a few pictures. <laughs> Supervisor Rice. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Kohler and Phyllis. It's so nice to be here. I stumbled on um, a, fair, a, a taping of a Fairfax Council meeting. I believe it was last year, maybe the year before. It was before you went to D.C. And um, you were telling your story. 
and the story was captivating. It was a reminder of, of the women in the World War II war effort. It was a reminder of the Rosies, and then it was so personal that it made it all come back alive. So when Barbara um, mentioned that they were, were, the council was adopting a resolution and creating a plaque to put up here in the town, um, I thought we should do the same thing with the Board of Supervisors. So I have a similar resolution, which is actually uh, recognizing, I'm not going to read it, all the Rosies of the Bay Area with special recognition to Phyllis Gould, and then a plaque, which is right here, which recognizes all the Rosies of the Bay Area that's going to find a special place up at the Civic Center. And when I know where that is, I will let you know and you can come visit. But anyway, congratulations and just thank you for you and all, all of you Rosies and what you've done and you're just inspiring. Well, I really appreciate all this recognition, uh, but it's what I've been working for, uh, to get the word out all across the nation that the women of World War II did a lot of things that no one expected us able to do. Uh, and we paved the way for women of the future. We didn't know it at the time, but what we did made people realize that if a woman set her mind to it, she could do anything she wanted. Do anything. The work in the shipyards was hard men's work, and we did it. So now, I keep getting brilliant ideas, and <laughs> one of them was the plaque but before that, it was a National Rosie the Riveter Day. And I talked to Jared Huffman, and he thought it was a good idea. And he took it to Jackie Spears and George Miller. They wrote the proposal for it, and it is in the hands of the president whenever he gets around to signing it. So we will have a national day. And uh, it's kind of unbelievable to me as just a plain person that I've managed to do so much. And it, uh, next weekend is the National American Rosie the Riveter Association Convention in Richmond. So I'll propose to them about the plaques and see what they can do across the nation. <laughs> so that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Supervisor Rice. Um, we know that the Board of Supervisors took this up yesterday, and you probably didn't want to steal our thunder. So <laughs> thank you for coming tonight. And thanks to Bob Koppelman, who's the Executive Director of the Chamber, for bringing Phyllis. And um, thank you all for your patience. And we'll get Phyllis some of those photographs for her book. So with that, we will move on. And the next Madam thing, Mayor, did, did you want to make a motion oh, to yes. adopt the resolution? Thank you. So would someone like to make the resolution? Uh, 
I should, I usually don't. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution. Second? I'll second. Um, Madam Mayor, technically you should ask if there's public comment. Oh yes, thank you. Is there public comment on this item? Seeing none, <laughs> thank you for that clarification. So I'll make the motion to approve the resolution. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. All right, so now we're going to move on to appointments of, no, no, we're not. I moved it. I'm doing the appointments. So we're, okay, uh, Sarah, I'm sorry, but you're just going to have to wait. Um, appointment of candidate to fill the vacancy on the planning commission. We had interviews. People could have um, come in for that. We had Three candidates, Mimi Newton was already interviewed prior in the prior council meeting. Cindy Swift and Chris Skelton were interviewed tonight. So um, I think what I will do is open it to the public if they have any comments on this and then we'll bring it back to the council. Uh, so if anyone from the public would like to speak on the planning commission uh, candidates. Oh, I see someone from our past. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I didn't get a chance to weigh in when Mimi was interviewed a, f a few weeks ago, but I, I do want to state publicly I support her. I think the Planning Commission should be a mixture of building professionals, designers, and neighborhood advocates, and I think Mimi really fills that second role and has already shown her leadership ability on open space and many other fundraising uh, projects for the town. So um, she gets my vote and I, I hope she's selected by the council tonight. So thank, thanks very much. Thank you, Larry. Um, anybody else want to speak on behalf of any of the candidates or make comments on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for any discussion or Motion. Uh, well, I think what we should do is any discussion first. None? Okay, so maybe what we should do is just um, we should each give our uh, which candidate we would select. It's just selecting one this time. It's not numbering people since we only have one opening. So, David, do you want to go first? Okay. Uh, Peter, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we do have some, some very good choices. Um, a couple months ago when we had uh, just a, a whole lot of openings on the commission, uh, we were all very concerned that there would be this void that would be very hard to fill. Um, and fortunately, uh, we have a, a different problem, which is uh, trying to make uh, a decision among some very good choices. Um, I, uh, you know, I was impressed with, uh, with Chris meeting him uh, and hearing his very thoughtful responses. Um, and uh, also appreciated hearing from Cindy. Uh, and I know Cindy's also been involved in the community a long time. Um, but I, I think I would uh, uh, choose to support uh, Mimi Newton. Um, she has, a, as Larry has expressed, a lot of involvement uh, in the community, a lot of knowledge, and um, uh, a real sense of uh, sort of the ethos of Fairfax and her uh, service on uh, open space I think is also very helpful. Um, and uh, I think also her legal background is also very helpful uh, as well. And I think that um, she would be a, a very good choice in, in thinking about the other folks on the commission. I think it, uh, her skill set uh, would also be very, uh, a good balance and I know Mimi's also very good at uh, collaboration and consensus building. And I think that's a very useful skill for the Planning Commission. So uh, those are my reasons for uh, supporting Mimi. John, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I was impressed with all three candidates for different reasons. Um, and. You know, it's too bad we can only pick one at this point, but I think, um, you know, I would agree with a lot of uh, my colleagues' 
points there. I mean, I think um, I, I've worked together with Mimi on uh, the GPIC and uh, also with some collaboration on open space things. And um, yeah, I, I find her to be somebody who jumps in and problem solves and looking at the makeup of the planning commission right now, she would be complementary to the, the makeup right now. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm sorry not to be picking Cindy. She's brought a lot to things in the past. And certainly Chris was very interesting too. I think he would bring his experience from being on the planning commission in Mill Valley, um, you know, had, would have a number of good things here. Um, I would anticipate that down the road, there's going to be more empty spots on this planning commission. So please come back. Okay. Um, but I would also throw my uh, endorsement towards Mimi. Um, Renee. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I, the, the fact that we had seven, am I correct? Seven uh, candidates to fill these positions is, um, is such a vote of confidence for this town and for the fact that this community is truly involved and is willing to face uh, whatever it takes to, um, to be heard and to, um, and to, you know, keep this town thriving um, and protect what we have here. And um, uh, th these candidates um, bring such valuable skills, each and every one of them. I, um, Cindy, so much appreciation for your um, participation in everything from the budgeting process to the Citizen Disaster Council, knowing the details, and as you stated yourself, you're a very detail-oriented person, which is vital for um, for the role on the Planning Commission. Um, I, I want to thank Chris, and I want to say don't go away if you're not chosen for this position, because it's great to have you in town, and David said, wow, you don't have any gray hair. So um, that's a good thing, and you're, and you're here, and uh, your skills would be so valuable for the town. Um, having said all that, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my vote for Mimi. Um, I, I, Mimi's work with Open Space and her knowledge of what, um, what it takes to preserve that, that precious open space is a very important piece of what we need on the Planning Commission. The way the built environment connects to the open space and how we plan for that I think is a piece that I haven't seen um, a role on the on the on the commission that I haven't seen um, represented and to the full extent that I think it should. So um, I'm going to choose Mimi and um, and and again, please thank you everyone for stepping up and keep stepping up. There's lots of good work to do. Uh, David, it's your turn. Um, you know, I was appointed to the Planning Commission and I only lived here for six months and I think in retrospect that, that was um, a, a too short a period. It's, it's good to be more uh, embedded within the town and the experience of living here and understanding its culture when you enter um, the, um, the Planning Commission, which I think is our most uh, important body. Um, and it's certainly our most important non-political body. Um, I, I happen to be a Cindy Swift fan. Uh, I think that she brings an extraordinary sober um, analysis to, to things and uh, when you're talking about planning and zoning codes and all that uh, stuff, I think that she um, would be an extraordinary um, addition. And I think John hit it on the head. There will be other positions because people come and go. It's, it's, um, it's a bit of a, a pressure cooker. And I've always, always surprised when people stay more than uh, two terms. And so there are other members who, who will be departing with our great thanks. Um, I, I think for the reasons I articulated, I, I'm going to go with Mimi. Um, just seeing her work on, on open space and, and other projects, um, as well as her comments even the ones I didn't agree with last year uh, on uh, the entire uh, housing element and the issues that we faced. The fact that she stepped into the, uh, into the battle and, uh, and articulated uh, her thoughts in front of the community, I think, was an important uh, quality because it's not easy to stand up in front of your community, give your thoughts, knowing that fully 50% of the people aren't going to agree with you. Um, and that's just the way uh, things go. So I'm going to s join everyone here. Um, 
and if I could, I would, I would advance the motion, um, if possible. Maybe I could speak? Uh, she is your best friend, so <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> but please. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I just want to say, um, I think Chris is new to town. Um, I think he brings a lot of expertise, but I'd really like to see Chris uh, consider being part of one of our many committees that have openings. I think um, it's a really good place to start getting a better feel for Fairfax. Mill Valley, maybe in the old days, was closer to um, Fairfax, but it's really changed. So um, we'd love to have you participate in some of our other committees, and I think you'll find it's a great opportunity. The volunteers do wonderful thing. Parks and Rec, open space, all are just critical to our town. And then Cindy, I became really a, a fan of Cindy's back when we were, I was the chief inspector for elections at Manor School for many years and I first met Cindy and quickly picked her out as the most astute and had her come with me to drop off the ballots. You don't trust just anybody to do that. And I've, I've known Cindy over the years uh, as she helped guide me a little bit through retirement and also recently took on the responsibility of kind of gathering our CERT volunteers for a disaster. And she's done an amazing job of kind of getting that together and participating in a disaster committee I attend every month with me. So I, I'm a real fan of Cindy's, but I'll also say I'm, I'm a bigger fan of Mimi's as far as Mimi has been in this town maybe nine, ten years, and she has volunteered since the day she stepped in. Uh, she's been the open space chair for something like eight years and really single-handedly has done so much to keep that committee going and some of the big efforts that that committee has done. She somehow convinced me at one point to join the committee and I continue to be the webmaster because I, f I feel it's such an important piece of our town. Um, also Mimi participated in the general plan uh, committee that worked on that plan. I don't know where she gets the time working in San Francisco commuting and the hours she puts in. Now she's been on the GPIC. Uh, she also was on the tree committee as an alternate for a while, so she continues to just step up on campaigns. She's, she walks precincts. She does whatever it takes to make our town a better place. So that's not to say that other people don't do that, but I have to say it's unanimous. I'm voting for Mimi on the planning commission, and I will say to people who aren't selected, the first time I was went for the planning commission, I wasn't selected and I came back and I was selected the second time. So there are gonna be opportunities, but I will also say some of these other committees are actually a little more fun. <laughs> There's a little more levity involved. So with that, I would also say Mimi and David, did you wanna make the motion? Yes, I'll make the motion to appoint uh, Mimi Newton as our um, seventh and completed planning commissioner. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So, thank you all, and uh, we'll move on to our next appointment, and I'll see, this is for appointing Sam Perry to fill one of the vacancies on the Fairfax Parks and Rec Commission. We have no other candidates, so I'd like to see if there's any public comment on Okay, no, on this item, so I'll bring it back to the council. Do there want to be any discussion or just a motion? Oh God, this is the easiest vote of the night. I'll just make a motion unless you want to speak to Sam as an extraordinarily gifted member of the community. If there would be a thousand of you in this town, uh, it would be too few. Um, you're an extraordinary addition to me and the, the culture that you bring to us uh, and the, the wisdom and the arts um, make us the town that we are and we cannot all thank you enough. So I think that's a motion. Second. And I, I would, <laughs> and I would second those uh, endorsements, but I'll, oh, sorry, do you want to? Okay, we can fight oh, for I'll this I'll stop one. there. Okay, um, but I'll, I'll second a motion and the thoughts. Okay, and uh, with that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, so thank you all. And with that, we will move on to open time.
Um, I hope Sierra didn't leave again and then wants to come back and have me op reopen it. Uh, step up. And if you would state your name and address if you feel comfortable doing so. Do. My name is Stephen Franks. I'm at 19 Willow Avenue. And uh, I'm here just to give a quick report. Um, it's not a bad report. It's actually things are looking better. It's about good earth. <clears throat> and I'm here tonight to... Uh, to uh, give a little progress from the owners of good earth to make a, from the excuse me. Progress from the owners of good earth to make good on a promise to institute a noise-free hour between five and six a.m. I have a letter written by one of the owners dated Wednesday, July thirty-first, two thousand thirteen, written to Bob Mellon and neighbors. One of the many promises is that were made will be no noise beepers used and no air breaks, noise is allowed. Garrett Toy was given a copy of this letter on May 11th when I met with him. Years later, starting about May 13th, the backup beepers have been greatly reduced with the exception of Saturday morning, 5 a.m. deliveries. Air breaks are still happening most every morning. I would like Jim or Garrett to make clear the permit hours of deliveries. This does not include the other small, smaller deliveries that are being made but I believe these are okay as long as the noise is kept to a minimum with beepers and air brakes. David, I would like to thank you. On April 1st meeting, you asked the question, why hasn't anything been done? The owners had signed their names on a use permit and the rules needed to be enforced. And you made that comment and it was a game changer. All of a sudden, people started to listen. The council, the, the uh, you know, Garrett and so forth, started to listen that the, the rules need to be enforced so well I can only um, you know just hope that the noise level will continue to drop with the backup beepers and the air brakes and that the owners of good earth will follow through with the permit rules and follow through with their promise to keep the noise down thank you very much appreciate it thank you I will be back down to try to get this on the agenda if the noise continues as it has for three and a half years. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Michael? Hello, Mayor. Um, I wanted to just make a comment for your consent. Maybe for the record, you might want to say your name. Excuse me, Michael McIntosh. Um, I just wanted to add some comments. I appreciate seeing that a letter will be written, um, um, I guess, discussing the concern. Like that? Oh, okay. Is that better? I, I can shout. So it's all good. No, I think she wants it bent. Okay, excuse me. Um, but for the Marin History Museum, I just wanted to give you some pertinent facts up to date so you can add that to your letter. Um, as of this last Friday, the DA actually issued a subpoena starting with BNC liquidators up in Sacramento. Uh, I spoke to Brian Johnson, who owns. Yeah, um, okay, so this is a consent calendar item. Yes. And potentially we could pull it or we could just take your comments on that. I was just going to give you comments. Yeah, but it's not an open time thing because it is on the agenda. So did you have something just for open time? Um, no, I can wait on that if you like. Okay, great. Thanks, Thank Michael. Um, Sierra, if you want to state your name and address, if you feel comfortable doing so. Sierra Salen, 23 Man Review. Um, I just want to start by saying I'm kind of mad at Barbara for changing open time because I left another meeting to come down here for open time, which is in the agenda at the beginning, and it's like it got moved. And it's you know I love Rosie and thank you Rosie and all that, but stick to the agenda that you've posted and have up so that other people can make their plans and follow them. Because I really wanted to be at this other meeting that I'm going to rush back to. Um, but that's not what I came here to say. So. Um, Recently, we got a mailer for some realtor um, stating that rents had gone up in Marin County by about 13% in two years. And isn't that great? Let's all invest in real estate. And it's like, no, I don't think that's great. I really think it, I'm not going to swear, I think it really messes up the community. It's like, I think we need to do something about rents, property values. Okay. I'll go on record saying it's fine with me if property values just tank to a large degree. Houses should not be big investments that we, I'm starting to rattle a little bit. Where I'm going with this is we need some kind of 
community form where people can invest in property and have stable rents and stable property values and when i say property values tank i don't mean like just tank through the bottom but i don't think property values need to appreciate by 10 percent and 20 percent and keep on going through the roof i think our community is getting totally messed up where is anybody who's not living at home between the ages of 18 and 35 going to live if they don't have a trust fund and i think that our community has about this much diversity of people everybody's professional and everybody plays the money game and is focused on it which is all fine and dandy but um, humans are an invasive species basically so let me look at this thing and see what i actually have we recently rented a rental and we could charge a whole lot more for it i know and everybody that looked at it wanted it and i wanted to rent it to everybody and i'm seeing more and more people forced out of our community to Sonoma County or wherever you know it's like rent control is a bad word and everybody's going to be down here like in droves that has any property but I think we need to do something and how to make it work so it's equitable so it's equitable for the owners and the tenants so that it's not skewed in some big mess either way and I'd also like to suggest that perhaps we could have some kind of tax on spec houses. I've seen some houses go on the market and get sold. People come in from out of town or wherever, and there's 20 trade trucks working on a house for two or three weeks or a month. And the house goes back on the market and gets marked up a bunch, and somebody from out of town makes a bunch of money, and the property values go up. How about if we have some kind of tax that says if you buy a house in town and sell it within two years and it appreciates a whole bunch, you do a whole bunch of work on it, you pay like 25% tax on the profits or something so that we keep like keep the housing stock in our community and not you know get anyway i don't know how to make it work i'd love if people want to talk to me and get something going i don't know if it's rent control or pooled resources to buy some property and have places where people live i'm just really sick of seeing people get forced out of our community and rents going up by 13 percent isn't that great no it's not great and la last point um, is Sarah, you've I, gone I know, I well know, past the three I, minutes. I know I've gone well past. And the last point Thanks. is Stu, the homeless, they're not homeless. He had more of a home than most of us did, and he was stable because he was there for 40 years. Stu left kind of a mess of books and stuff up on the hill. I'd like to organize a bunch of people to carry down about a cubic yard or two of, of old books and moldy stuff. I'm wondering if the town would offer their truck for us to like get a bunch of people and throw the stuff into. It's mostly recycling, I think, but yeah, it would be good I, I to clear off the hillside. I think for liability reasons we can't, but we can ask Garrett talk to you about that. And Thank Sarah, you. when you're 93 years old, I'll reorganize the agenda for you. <laughs> All right, and, thank and you very much. Lynn, if you'd give your name and address. Yeah. Ling Xian Bell, I live on 63 Dominga. And uh, I'm wondering the, what the situation is with the bridges that are, there's kind of easements, I, I think, the bridges that go over the creek, like there's one, uh, it goes to forest, it, it goes from Dominga to forest, and it's the, at the end of, it's not bridge court, it's, uh, what is it, uh, this little street the where, one. yeah, the one that goes to, no, uh, well, it's, is it called Sherman? Yes. The bridge that goes to, yes. and then there's stairs? Yeah. So anyway, that bridge is a really, really nice bridge. It's really good. It's old redwood, and it's really made to last a really long time. But there's a lot of ivy that grows on the post. And I, I was concerned about that, and I asked Clive to clean it. First, I tried to clean it myself, but it's really hard to do, actually. I mean, it's kind of hard to do to, to get it so it doesn't come back. And I'm just wondering what who is responsible for, for maintaining those bridges. I'm not, it's not really that clear, even I, because he was concerned to ask uh, to be trespassing the people because you have to go to their, their land in order to address those posts. And so I asked the people and I told them that it was okay if he came to clear that up. Anyway, it's, uh, I'm just wondering a little bit what. Yeah, I believe yeah. that bridge that's on the end of Bridge Court you're talking about, the wooden one that goes to The wooden by one that John's. goes to John's house, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a public right of way. That's a public right of way. So, so that's like a street. So it's, it's a, so then is it the town then? Yes. That's a, so so is there any way to to make sure that the ivy it, it, that it keeps clear from the post because if um, it, if they rot, 
Uh, Garrett, why don't you look into it? Okay, he's writing it down, so we'll okay. look into it. All right, that would be great. Thank, so you. thank you. Yes, thanks. You. Yeah. Next, please. If you could state your name and address if you feel comfortable doing so. I don't really like microphones. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I'm Sue Byrne, and I live at 107 Mono. And uh, I w I'm here to follow up on a topic that was discussed last month, um, the topic of hunger, um, food scarcity and uh, hunger, specifically the CalFresh program. Um, I work for the county in the Public Assistance Division, and uh, we're the division that um, does eligibility determinations um, for the CalFresh or food stamp program. And so when I saw the article um, that laid out the discussion that had taken place here, I brought it to work so we could all talk about it, um, you know, to look at what our, how we're being perceived in the community. And um, so I came tonight because I just wanted to make a couple of points. Um, the first is, you know, thank you for discussing the topic. Um, hunger and food scarcity can't be talked about enough in my mind. Um, and also, um, I wanted to let you know that while the process um, was described as cumbersome, we're doing our best and we're making huge progress in streamlining the process, making it easier for people to apply, easier to, um, to verify income, particularly for people who are getting um, unemployment or social security, things that we can verify electronically. You don't have to come to the office. Um, everything can be done. The interview can be done over the phone. We can send out the cards. Um, we want to make it accessible to as many people as possible. Um, Marin County is a county that, um, when you look statistically, we have um, a huge gap between the number of people who are presumed to be eligible and the number of people who are currently enrolled. Um, and so that brings me to my second point. Um, May was Cal Fresh Awareness Month, and um, you know we were out in the community doing presentations at schools and um, senior centers, community festivals, things like that. And um, I just kind of wanted to put it out to everybody here that, um, that we're available to do outreach. If anybody is a member of a group or knows of a group that thinks that there's uh, people who could benefit to finding out about, about the process, what benefits are available, and uh, giving us a chance to, to demystify the process in any way we can, um, we're always happy to, uh, to come to the community and, uh, and talk to people. So thanks again for bringing up the topic and uh, for giving me a chance to talk a little more about it. Can I, Sue? I'm just wondering, I, the obvious link, of course, is um, Holly and Larry in the back there. You guys are communicated, I assume, about the f from food bank perspective and the whole... That was going to be my next step, because the, okay. the food bank does have a sisters who work through the food bank and actually help people fill out the, fill out the paperwork. Um, and so I've been talking to the food bank people, um, you know, as so kind I think of the, the large organization. The point is, Sue, um, Holly Bragman and Larry Bragman are in the back. Right. Yeah. And they've been running the food bank with George Taylor. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so before you leave, you should probably connect with them. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for you. coming, Sue. Sure. Mel, if you could state your name and address if you feel yep. comfortable doing so. Do I need that on? Okay. Hi, Melanie Paradis, 25 Park Road. Um, I'm just um, going to quickly um, revisit something I came to open time and mentioned last time and haven't heard back on, which related to the pavilion parking lot being repaved, which was great. But when they did it, they um, paved over a whole bunch of what was green space, open ground with plants and whatnot. So my question was about whether the town has a policy um, when projects are happening to not lose open ground. In other words, permeable surface where water can run through and that also serves for carbon sequestering and also, um, you know, is our, creates beauty in our town and every time we pave over more ground we're just uglifying more of it. So that was my question. I didn't hear back from staff so I'm just still wanting to get an answer on that. Um, Garrett, could you get back to Mel, please? Sure, or, there, there is no policy. There okay. is no policy. There is no policy. That's the answer. So maybe one of the things we can work on um, over the next year, maybe with your assistance, is 
uh, some kind of a policy. One of the things we worked on was an environmental practices and purchases policy, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily go to that area, but that might be something we could add to Put it. In so, Garrett, yeah. did you want to say something? As clarification, normally, and it's a project by project basis, you would look at those things. But the pavilion was somewhat isolated because we were trying to maximize the parking spaces. Right. And yeah, I think. Yeah, Th I get that was that, that was yeah. a difficult situation, mm -hmm. and but um, one of the things we can talk about is maybe just a short policy. I think John wants to say something, but we have to remember this is open time, so we're not supposed to take a lot of action. That that's true, but um, I mean, I just wanted to point out that I believe in the past I've heard about Fairfax having a no net loss of parking policy, but we don't have a no let net loss of green space policy, and so. Since they are competing interests very often, I think that if we want to adopt a policy on that, we should take that up as a council, as a formal policy. We're not have more discussion on this, that's um, fine. Garrett. Maybe that's something that yeah, as a future agenda we can put it as a future agenda item. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, you guys. Bye. Hi there. If you could state your name and hi, my name is Marcia Custer. I live at Twelve Fortieths. Just a brief clarification here. Um, I work for the SF Marin Food Bank. I'm the general manager of the food bank in Marin in Nevada. We service 51 uh, pantries throughout the county, Fairfax being our one of our favorite. Thank you, the Bragmans. Um, and I just want to clarify that within the food bank in Marin, we have a staff, and there is CalFresh outreach. There are the pantries and there's uh, uh, the, the many homes that we serve. So there's a huge distribution and that there is a link that we're trying to get closer so that the pantries all have uh, people coming in that are can also, besides accessing all the food that we bring, they can come in and they can sign up for CalFresh. So we're working on that. Just want clarification. Great, thank you. Mark? If you could state your name and address if you feel comfortable doing so. I always feel comfortable. Uh, Mark Bell, 63 Dominga. I just have a, a question because I thought that there was some type of permeable surface uh, ordinance that was spoken about, which I thought had been passed like a couple years ago. So did that not happen? I'm not aware of any ordinance that uh, I remember that requirement. I remember it being brought up and talked about in town council for people with, you know, driveways or replacing driveways and stuff. So it's a storm water. It's a storm water issue uh, when folks are building uh, homes, additions, what's, um, that there's a responsibility to take certain actions to ensure that um, since you're taking away permeable surfaces, that you have an effective means by which to control the stormwater so that you're not adding it um, to the co combined stormwater that is flowing off of everybody else's property and hitting the creeks. Okay, so it wasn't necessarily directed at um, permeable surfaces for parking or driveways. It was just mm -hmm. an overall condition as far as if someone's doing some type of home improvement that they have to deal with the water. To the best of my recollection that's true and this is a little bit to the side of that but not totally divorced from it okay thank yeah. you yeah i mean i agree i think uh larry bragman would like to yeah, speak I, no we do we did uh either introduce an ordinance or a regulation to either require or permit uh, permeable paving so and that would be my critique of the parking lot it's you're going to have a lot more surface water flow into the creek so the policy should be zero runoff. And we can probably do that with even in the present configuration if we put, up, put in some swales and things so that we can just absorb the water that runs off of it. Aside from the loss of you know, the grass and stuff that Mel was concerned about. Okay. But I'll but find it, I'll, I'll find it. We, okay. did, we did do that probably around seven, eight years ago. Seven years ago? Seven, eight years ago. Okay, sure. so maybe Garrett, Michelle can take a look for it as well. I'll look for it. Thank you, Thanks. Larry. Okay, um, so let's, uh, anybody else for open time? Okay, seeing none. Um, we now have the consent calendar and I wanted to find out if, um, I know Michael McIntosh wanted to speak on item 21. Um, and I know Renee has a comment. 
Yeah, I have a comment. Um, could we please uh, pull number seven, which is the reappointment of Holly Bragman to the volunteer board? And could I please request that we have that come up immediately following consent? It would be a brief presentation of some of the accomplishments of the volunteer board. Um, and I think it's really important that we hear from Holly and from the other board members. It would be brief. Okay, let's, it would need to be brief because we've got a pretty full agenda. So let's pull that item, item seven. I also think, Renee, you wanted to say something about item 12. No, I, yeah, I will um, recuse myself and could we pull item 12? Yes, item 12 um, and, and do uh, the approval um, at the end and I will recuse myself. Um, I think, we, okay, we don't need to pull item 12. We can pull it off consent and do it as a separate consent item. A separate consent item is what yes. I mean. You'll just yeah. need to leave. That's what I mean. And then let's pull item 21, the Marin History Museum, because Michael had some comments on that. And what I would suggest is that we move item 7 and item 21 directly after the consent calendar, after we deal with a separate consent calendar item, and then move on. So uh, is that amenable to the council? Do I need a, a motion on that? No. no. Okay, everybody. Oh, what? A couple other things. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, just uh, on number 20, um, in, in support of you sending the letter, but also to note that the MCCMC Ledge Committee has also uh, taken the same position uh, that you were advancing. Uh, and of course, uh, I am in support of it. Um, the other thing, I will abstain from number 19 as that is one of those issues that are beyond uh, the Fairfax borders. I uh, certainly respect and applaud uh, Councilmember Lacks bringing it forward, but it's my position to abstain on, on these matters. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that, we've got item 12 we'll vote on separately, item 19 we'll vote on separately, and we're gonna pull item seven and 21 and move those, we'll take those up directly. Um, but uh, can I have a motion to approve Excuse the- Excuse me, Mayor. Yes, I'm sorry. I was going to ask clarification on 13 and 15, please. What's the clarification? Um, if I could just have an understanding of how you set a tax rate for a pre, it's not a trick question. Yeah. But, and I tried to look and there wasn't something for me to read out there. It just says that we will set the tax rate and for like the measure K that already be a set bond and the second one for the second tax, I'm curious how we're altering that if, if I um, Michael, can you give a very brief succinct discussion of how those were set? And I think those Thank have you. been set for many, many years. So 13 is yes. the uh, special municipal services tax that was passed in the election at 195 uh, per unit, and that's what we actually have, have in here as the rate that's going to be charged. Okay, so no, nothing so is being changed. It's nothing just is being to changed. set we're just, what we just, already agreed. Each year we have to uh, readopt this. Excuse me, same with 15? Uh, 15 is the same rate that we had the year, okay. uh, the prior year, and that's the... I'm good. I was just curious if there okay. was a way to change it. Thank you. No, no changes. Okay, so uh, any other public comment, Holly? Um, yeah, I, I think my presentation and our concern was actually regarding number 18, if it can be considered to get pulled. 18, the adoption of a resolution continuing expenditures and revenue, revenues? I think that's the one, because the volunteer board had submitted. Um, that so would be part of the budget hearing, Holly. This mm -hmm. is just continuing yeah. things. This just keeps things going on. It's the budget okay. hearing is Whether coming up as item 22. Okay. okay, I'm just telling you that's what my presentation is on, so. Okay, well, I thought not we wanted. My, not my reappointment. Okay. That, that would be very short. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Okay. All right, so what we're doing is we're going to vote on item 12 separately, 19 separately, but and we're pulling item seven and 21, and we're moving those, we'll cover those after the consent calendar quickly. So uh, I'd like a motion on the consent calendar minus those items. I will move approval of consent uh, less the, should I, do I, should I say the things again? You just heard her say it. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. I mean, I'll say it again if you want. But no. no, okay. And then seven and seven and twenty-one and twelve and nineteen. But I'll okay, twelve and nineteen are not pulled. We're sep We're voting on them separately. Well, yeah, but right now we're voting on everything. Okay. Else. So well, second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's take up. Um, Item 19 separately, I'd like um, a motion to approve item 19 and then a roll call vote on that. Yes, I, I, it's uh, my resolution and I would uh, make a motion to adopt a resolution opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, also known as TPP, and any fast track ratification process, also expressing our concerns about elements of the TPP and supporting fair trade practices that protect jobs, workers, the environment, public health, and the free and open internet. Okay, and a second on that? I would gladly second that. Okay, and then I guess, should we do a roll call? Or just all in favor? Aye. 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 And then? Abstain. Okay, and then Renee, would you leave the room for item 12? If you're recusing yourself, you need to leave the room. Thank you. Okay, so I would like a um, motion to approve item 12. Just remember so, public comment. Oh, public comment. Public comment on item 12. Seeing none. Okay, bringing you back. Thank you, Garrett. I would uh, move approval of that contract. Okay, second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, someone can open the door and tell Renee to come back in. Protocol. She escaped. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take up item seven, and I just want to remind folks we have people waiting here for a couple of items. So hopefully, uh, this is a wonderful reappointment of Holly Bragman to the Fairfax Volunteer Board and Renee did you want to make some comments or did someone want to make comments? Yeah I mean th this is a reappointment of Holly in, in the you know the item on the consent calendar but I, I, I pulled it because I'd like to have Holly and the other members of the Volunteer Board be one acknowledged and two just make a brief presentation so that the community knows what exactly the Volunteer Board does which is a whole lot of things. And so I'd like to give them a chance to voice that. Um, and uh, so that's why I asked it to be pulled. So Holly. Holly, you want to okay. talk about Thanks. the accomplishments of yourself and the volunteer board? Oh, yeah, I, this is what I love to do. Um, I just won't go away. Um, thank you for reappointing me. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so um, I, my, my presentation is somewhat mixed with our accomplishments and some part of it is really a stump for um, the budgetary stuff. So I hope this is the appropriate time to do this because um, we, we were really happy when um, the brand new procedure of the manager asking us for um, our goals and budget needs and whatnot. And um, then we were a little surprised that we didn't really get many of those and some of it was decreased. So um, I have the wish list here, but I don't want to go through that. I just kind of wanted to make points of. Right now you're, you're just talking about accomplishments of the volunteer board. You will have to wait till the budget to talk about your wish list or okay. your. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about that then. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm going to have to really ferret out what I, my accomplishment part of this is. Um, I mean, basically the, the, we feel the volunteer Board, um, the dollars spent with us are a good bang for the buck um, and that we involve community um, in doing projects and then therefore the projects are better for it. Um, we have a few examples of that I guess um, like a few years back when Helen Voss and her neighborhood came and asked um, for a pilot chipper day to be done in the scenic neighborhood um, we really did an incredible um, job, the community did, um, 
of chipping a lot of debris for a very small price. Um, and we have a couple projects going now that I think are good examples um, also of what can be accomplished as the, the Fairfax Volunteer Board. Um, the Power Lane Trail was, I mean, basically what we do is people from the community come to us and they say, I care about this, can you help us? And if people have juice for stuff, which is what John likes to say, we want to facilitate uh, that because we want to do what the community wants us to do. So um, the Power Lane Trail is one great example of a neighborhood that came to the volunteers and said, uh, we have someone who wants to help with this. We need um, a partner. We need a little bit of money. We need some other volunteers. And um, I encourage you to go look at that project. It's a really great example of how um, this model can work. Um, and the other, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I have all this. <laughs> I don't want to. Um, well, maybe I should add something that came up recently. So the Red Cross is doing a free um, smoke detector installation in some multi-unit complexes. And as part of a committee I sit on, I hook them up with you. And without any hesitation, you said, yes, we'll be happy to help. Uh, the fire department and you guys are willing to help. And I think Cindy Swift is going to help as well. So I think what my experience is, is things don't get turned down. <laughs> you know, you guys are always willing to help. and. I think you're just a great resource. So if that helps kind of give, you know, that's a really small example of the many things that the volunteers have done over the years. And I think with your leadership, um, you've really continued on the great tradition. And like you say, just really want to help out and, you know, don't color these requests and just really come back saying, okay, how can we do it? So it's, it's, really wonderful that you you and all the volunteers are part of this community and are just willing to step up. Okay, I just, one final thing would be, I know we're known for our sort of feel good, you know, community um, building events, but um, we, we do have a number of projects that can contribute to like the, the wellness and health of the community and also to public safety, so. Um. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to add, though, that um, one of the great roles that you guys have played in the community is that, is that me or you? Is that um, you guys have a way for people to sign up to assist and volunteer in all the things and events and, and projects that need to be done in the town. People are always looking for how do I sign up, how do I, how do I join, how do I contribute, and that's the, one of the basic things that this town is built on is volunteerism. What was the name of the campaign last year? Volunteer one time a year? What was it? Yeah, and... It, y for the love of Fairfax, volunteer. For the love of one Fairfax. Um, and so anyway, Fairfax volunteers, you should all um, look them up, sign up to do things. Um, they, they are an excellent organization, and we actually couldn't, couldn't uh, survive as a town without you guys. So I just wanted you to give us some some meat. So um, I hope I didn't put you on the spot. Great. Yeah. So okay. I would. It's, it's oh. kind of the accolade section. I mean, the volunteers, <laughs> they do great stuff from the trails, the picnic, the you know things in the winter. There's a lot of community events that basically build community and a lot of things that help people all over the place. And it's a good organization. So I would move to reappoint Holly for another three-year term, please. And a second? I second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Holly. Okay, so let's take up. So let's take up item 21 now and Hopefully, we don't need to have a lot of discussion at the council level. Um, um, I think we. No, I mean, this is my item. Um, basically, I um, was put together an initial letter to send there, basically looking to um, 
say don't throw anything away, especially from Fairfax, and we are interested in all these items. And um, that letter was redacted from the agenda just so that we could have a public hearing here. And, and so since it's a public document, we didn't want that to them to just say, oh, that, that's it, without anybody adding any extra stuff, which um, if you have more information to add to that letter, that would be more than welcome. Absolutely. The person that you want to send to, I'll give you her email. So I'm opening it for public comment. <laughs> uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. It's just something I would like to participate in. Um, because I have been in contact with Matthew Himmel, Sarah Jones, Damon Conley, Katie Rice, um, Stephen Woodside, Gary Phillips, the Attorney General, actually four Attorney Generals. The person that you want to send that letter to is Elizabeth.Kim at doj.ca.gov. Okay, she is the Attorney General actually in charge of the investigation. Um, let's see, to bring up current status, the county and, as well as City of Sarenfeld made a request that they would certainly support helping them. The county went further and offered $25,000 if they would agree not to sell items and if they would give them a current accounting of what was sold. They have refused. Both the county as well as City of San Rafael has made requests, multiple requests, the first time for just Jean Zerudo, myself, and Gary Phillips, second time for our two different groups to come together. Jean Zerudo has refused. The um, let's see, Attorney General has been in contact with them, but since it's an open investigation, it's a very one-sided conversation at this time that she's not sharing much with me. The District Attorney has decided that there could be things beyond malfeasance, and they have already issued subpoenas. I was in contact with Brian Johnson, who runs BNC Liquidators. That was the company that was asked to come in at night, take items out, and sell them at garage sales without provenance or pedigrees. Nothing was auctioned. These were used to salt estate sales throughout the foothills and in Sacramento. Brian Johnson's subpoena was supposed to be issued, and he is waiting for it on Friday. Um, I believe the first one will probably be just a deuces tecum, so a request for records. Um, I don't know if they'll go further at this time, but we're certainly hoping. I would also ask the town of Fairfax not to request items from Fairfax, because really what's happening here, the current board has blown through $8 million, as well as additional funds even from these proceeds. And what they really want to do is they want to close this down to hide any sort of improprieties, which have included, to just give you guys a couple of highlights, a phantom employee that had been on payroll for a very long time, as well as a board member receiving an executive uh, director salary. So these are things that are just big no-nos. Um, but what they would like to do is they'd like to get rid of all their tangible items within their collection and then donate the ephemera, the ephemera being the maps, books, photographs, images, and documents. If they're able to do that, they can make a, ras a mass resignation to the Secretary of State, thereby um, bypassing the Attorney General's office and ask for a dissolution by showing that a corporation, which is still a 501, um, can ask to be dissolved as long as they show and satisfy that they have paid all outstanding debts. I was just emailed when I sit in the back of the room that I guess a notice from the Board of Equalization has come out from the state of California that they're delinquent on those taxes. Last, last 990 that was filed with Secretary of State was filed in 2012. So we also want to see the 2013 and 14. So again, if the town of Fairfax would support some of these facts and send your concerns, it would be very much appreciated. But I would not like, we have actually reached out to all historical um, societies because they, as long as they understand they've been in compliance, not to request any items because we do not want the entire museum dissolved because then we have no accounting of what has been sold, what is gone. Things that were sold even included items that were on loan that they did not own. And I can state that for a fact because I've personally purchased back multiple items hoping to benefit a future museum that will remain as the Marin History Museum for our entire community. Thank you, yeah. Michael. Yeah, the, so, inten oh, yeah, the ahead, intention John. was to talk about the items being a valuable to Fairfax and you know people in Fairfax and they are of value a lot to of value. our community. Yes, in, in they fact, are in the, significant. In the article yeah. in newspapers how I also <laughs> first became involved in this. I've personally given that museum, um, <clears throat> in fact, for Fairfax, I've given them over 400 bottles or directed over 400 bottles to be given to them that were all Marin County bottles that were made 
generally by proprietors around the turn of the last century because Marin County used to be the, last, the largest producer of milk within any county of the um, state of California. I've also given them probably in excess of 1,500 documents pertaining to Fairfax because I was just looking at a donation list that um, I can give Michael, to Michael, I'm sorry to interrupt you, no but problem. we've gone on, and Absolutely. I think one of the things that Thank you for your John could probably talk to you offline a little bit about this. Okay. I think we want to be kind of judicious on the type of letter we send um, in understanding that we are Fairfax. So, um, But we're all part of Marin. We are. Uh, but we'll see how much we kind of detail we can put in that letter, and I think John can probably talk to you offline. Anything I can do to offer to help, I am very pleased. Thank you very much for taking this cause up. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so um, did we, uh, bring it back to the council, did we want a motion to authorize the mayor to send a letter to the Marin History Museum? Um, anybody want to make a motion, et cetera? I also move um, to uh, authorize the mayor to send a letter in opposition. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> authorize the mayor to send a letter to the Marin History Museum regarding the disposition of artifacts and or archival documentation associated with Fairfax. And I would amend that to uh, be relative to the county at large. A yeah, second. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, so um, we're going to have to keep this quick. We did not cover council member reports last time, so you can cover both months, but you still get three minutes. So, um, <laughs> so with that, let's start at Peter Lack's end. Uh, well, I'll keep it brief. Uh, the most interesting I did, thing I did, I attended the um, Marin Clean Energy Board meeting um, in lieu of uh, Barbara, who was not able to make it, and uh, some very exciting things happening. Uh, a major solar project going online in Richmond, 10 megawatts on a, a brownfield site. Uh, a lot of emphasis on energy efficiency. Um, it, our uh, reach has spread into Richmond and Napa, and uh, it's really exciting to see uh, the incredible power and potential uh, that um, is, is there to promote renewable energy. So um, some very exciting things happening with Marin Clean Energy, and I uh, was uh, very pleased to learn more about it. Thank you, Peter. Renee. Um, yeah, this was a couple of months of extraordinary, um, extraordinary number of meetings, um, but I won't go back too far because it should be that the previous month's meetings would inform and take us to where we are today. So I'll start with, I'll just cover this uh, uh, this month. So um, probably one of the one of the big important changes for next year is going to be that. Golden Gate Transit will no longer be servicing the bus lines, the school, the designated school lines that Marin Transit has always contracted to Golden Gate Transit. Um, they will be yellow school buses. Um, it's important now that uh, White Hill families, especially in other um, elementary schools in the Ross Valley School District, go online to Marin Transit and sign up to get a spot on the yellow school bus. Um, and uh, you will notice that uh, the cost has come down slightly. We're working on bringing it down as far as possible. It won't be as inexpensive as it has been in the past, but I think it's, uh, it's quite affordable. Um, the other thing, and I'm not going to go through all mine, but the other thing that um, I think is, uh, is important um, at this point in terms of our zero waste work, um, looking at the pharmaceutical ordinance that Marin County is working on, which would be an extended producer responsibility requirement for the pharmaceutical industry to pay for the safe disposal of uh, the unwanted and unused and expired um, pills. Um, Alameda County got the furthest, um, and uh, it got to the level of the California Supreme Court, and it was not heard in the Supreme Court. Uh, which means that at this point, there's 
a little more of an opportunity for the other counties um, to move forward with ordinances um, requiring the pharmaceuticals participation, shared responsibility in dealing with these things safely. Uh, San Mateo County's gone through, Santa Clara County's gone through. Uh, we just had a working group meeting a few days ago, and um, it looks like the County of Marin will move forward with this ordinance um, sometime, as is promised, in the next uh, six or so weeks. So stay tuned. Okay, John? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the last, uh, we'll just note that there were seven meetings that I was going to talk about for last month. One of the other things that I was going to talk about last month was it's more of something that happened uh, and I just thought it would be good to talk about it in a public meeting such as this because just to get the word out um, there was a lot of people upset um, about this basically the, there was a pair of nesting hawks that tend to nest for life hawks eat a lot of rodents and there's in Fairfax as many people know we have a lot of you know, rats along the creeks um, Somebody had put out some rat poison um, uh, kind of behind the library. And, um, and of course, one of these hawks ate one of the rats because they're moving slow. And, if, you know, the, somebody had found the dead hawk and the other hawk was pretty freaked out, screaming for the, its partner, they mate for life. Um, and I basically wanted to take this opportunity to talk about this in a public way that um, basically when you're poisoning rodents, you're slowing them down and you're poisoning the predators that eat the rodents that do a lot better job than you know buying some rat poison and throwing it around. Um, and um, you know they reproduce really fast and the hawks and owls are really good at getting rid of rats and please do not put rat poison out for it because it you know basically the rat's going to move in, you know into the wall of your house and stink for weeks and it's not a good solution. At any rate, um, we had gotten rat poison removed out of Fairfax Lumber um, and other stores that everybody had agreed to stop carrying it a couple years ago and um, uh, you know I don't know where this rat poison came from but um, at any rate please do not approach the problem in that way. Um, the other things uh, this meeting uh, this month I guess there's one two three four five six seven eight nine meetings I'm not going to talk about them all. Um, let me see, I did uh, hit, the, uh, I'll hit the highlights. I went to a traffic calming workshop in San Anselmo, different strategies people can use to keep traffic from blasting through their streets really fast, and some of those skills will be useful here. If people are interested in that, they could talk to me, um, and we can see about doing things like that here. Um, I presented a couple of um, proclamations signed by the mayor of this council for a couple of Eagle Scouts from our community. Uh, last Sunday, um, and uh, so that's good to support our youth doing that, and they did projects that helped our community. Um, budget workshops, fire boards, stuff like that. That's the usual business, so thanks. David. Uh, three, th uh, three things. Uh, the first is I had the opportunity to do a, uh, a ride-along um, uh, uh, with the thanks of the chief. Um, and I urge uh, all of you to take uh, the opportunity to do that. It, it showed me, as I'm sure it would show you, the extraordinary work and training that our officers have, uh, the dedication that they have, the restraint that they have. I was there for the entire evening. I saw traffic infractions that would turn your head and not a single ticket was given, but uh, Corporal Kate uh, pulled over each and every one of them, um, spoke to them sternly about what they had done and why they will not be doing it again, left them with a warning um, and, and sent them on their way. Um, these are extraordinary men and women and we are um, blessed to have them under the chief's uh, tutelage and uh, direction. The second is uh, Flood Zone 9 is now meeting on a regular monthly basis and uh, if you're ever going to attend a meeting, uh, it would require that you probably don't um, Root for the Warriors, it would be the sixth game of the NBA Finals. But on Tuesday the 16th, the Flood Zone 9 is meeting. Um, and we have pretty much moved to the stage where it's the uh, fish or cut bait period. And we will be uh, examining all current and some suggested uh, tentative alternative uh, sites for flood control. 
these these meetings at this point have uh, i think they're coming to the culmination of many uh, years of work and members of the community that are very interested would want to have a, a heightened focus on what's going on i, I would uh, suggest uh, the the county website on this is is really quite well done um, and the final uh, thing is that um, coming out of our measure a funds that we'll be talking about in a little bit uh, in the budget process uh, the Measure A Committee has identified and recommended, and I think we touched upon this a little bit in our uh, budget uh, workshop last week, uh, some measure funds to entirely redo the uh, park at uh, Klaus Circle, which is an underutilized and, and horribly overgrown re resource. Um, in collaboration with Jody Timms, our very dedicated uh, representative to the Commission on Aging and the work that she's doing, she and I uh, visited with a few members uh, of the Klaus Circle community. We've now set up a meeting uh, in about two weeks for a more formal meeting, and we'll begin to, they, they've actually been meeting a little bit uh, about what they would like to see and have forwarded some ideas. So it'll be those ideas uh, in collaboration with ones that uh, Garrett has identified. Uh, and I think uh, with a little bit of luck, I would like to say by the end of the year when you uh, head over to the Bicycle Museum, uh, when you're done, head over to an entirely reconstructed park that will be age friendly. Um, I think it'll be a great achievement for us. Thank you. Great. Um, so I attended probably in the last few months about 20, 25 meetings, but I'm just going to touch on a couple of things that I did that I thought, think you might find interesting. Um, one of the things you may not know is we have a new postmaster in town, Judy Running Deer, and she's really been a breath of fresh air. There's been a lot of improvements in the running of our post office. So we had an installation for Judy and uh, it was a very nice event. She also got a new staff person in there, so there's more staff, actually, when you go in to buy your stamps. Um, I participated in a couple of Marin Clean Energy meetings, and thanks to Peter for filling in for me, but also their fifth anniversary event and prevented, presented three workforce awards. Uh, Fairfax Climate Action meeting, uh, I testified at the Board of Supervisors as Judge, uh, Council Member Reed in support of the Sky Ranch project. Uh, another thing I did that first time for me was participated as a judge at the Margie Burke speech tournament at the Ross School for kind of preteens and younger kids. And it was a great event, so I got to see a lot of younger kids in actions. Um, and there was a lot more, but that's enough for now. And with that, let's move on to the town manager report. Uh, I have nothing to report, and that includes on the wall property. So nothing new on the wall property? Uh, nothing new on the wall property. Okay, thank you. So with that, um, I'm wondering if we could take a five-minute break before we start the budget hearing. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. And we are going to do item 22, public hearing, discuss, consider fiscal year 2015 proposed operating and capital improvement budget. Um, Garrett, were you going to do the staff report? Uh, yes. OK. So we have a PowerPoint. And so quickly, we're we're pleased to present to the council the proposed operating and capital budget for fiscal year 15-16. Uh, special thanks to our finance director, Michael Vivret, for preparing the document. Uh, council may recall you had your budget workshop last week on May 28th. Uh, you did suggest revi revisions. We'll go over that on a couple of slides. Uh, but at the budget workshop, we did not have the opportunity to discuss the five-year CIP and future funding issues. And the council indicated you would also discuss that this evening at the public hearing. And again, this and is CIP for the oh, purposes of people sorry. out there is the five year CIP is our capital improvement program for the town. So with that, we can go through next slide. So 
the fiscal year 15-16 operating or the proposed overall budget is 10.4 million. That's about 200,000 less than what I referred to as last year's or fiscal year 14-15's budget. General fund appropriations are about 8.1 million. Capital improvement projects are about 1.7 million. Um, that's about 500,000 less than last year. And the special funds debt service are about 600,000. That's really stayed about the same. In terms, if you want to see some apples to apples comparisons, you could see that compared to the adopted 14-15 budget, the proposed budget is going to have about 440,000 more in general fund revenues and transfers. In terms of expenditures, it's about 290,000 more. Uh, in looking at those numbers, you may say, well, you have a lot more revenues than expenditures. But I'd like to point out in fiscal year 14-15, the town was actually to tap, plan and tap into general fund reserves by about 140,000. We're not doing that this year, so that's in essence how you're making up the difference. And one other note to point out, in the adopted 14-15 budget, we actually overstated uh, sales tax revenues due to a, a counting, double counting. And so that had to be taken out of the equation. But that kind of shows you what the differences between the two budgets are. In terms of where the money comes from, no surprises, comes from property tax, sales tax, and we actually broke out Measure J. Uh, if you combine all those, you will see it's almost 80% of your revenue comes from those three sources. In terms of where the money goes to, you could tell that most of it goes to police and fire, that's 60%. If you were actually to break it out by personnel, main salary and benefits, it would be about 70% of your operating budget. Okay, now to get into budget highlights. In terms of budget highlights, we had talked about general fund revenues and transfers being about 440,000 higher than last year. Uh, most of that comes from the renewal of Measure J. You actually gained about $250,000. Property tax was up, 185,000. And this year, as opposed to the other years, we're actually including the recreation revenues right into the general fund revenues, where before it was considered a special fund. And I'll touch on more in a minute on that. In terms of general fund appropriations, like I said, it's up by about 290,000. It's about 3.5%. Uh, fire, fire services is going to go up by over 130,000. Reasons for that, um, they do have to pay more for retirement, and you'll see what the impact on the town was. Uh, they had a little increase in overtime to reflect really what their numbers have been. And in past years, the town actually had an operating reserve with the fire department, and we were drawing down on that to kind of keep the costs artificially low. There's a, that has been all used up in essence, and the result is we have an increase of fire of about 100, over 130,000, about 7%, I think, in our overall fire contract. CURS, CalPERS side fund, what that is, is that's our retirement account. PERS basically has recalculated how they calculate retirement, whereby before what they did was they applied a percentage against your payroll. And what they've decided is that's sort of unsustainable because as people retire and leave, uh, they're just not able to create a high enough percentage. So what they did is re they recalculated that and put that in the side fund, which is somewhere between five and six million. But the net result is it's 230000 higher than we originally uh, anticipated. So that's a hit to the budget. Um, in terms of overall expenses, we kind of went through expenses quite carefully. And what we've done is we've actually done a net reduction in operating expenses. And that's to the what we'll call non-personnel type expenses. What that means is we took a look and took out one-time capital expenditures. That's not going to occur on an ongoing basis. Uh, we did move some funding around. So, for example, trails now is funded complete with Measure A and not with the general fund. Uh, we did have some reduction overall in consulting costs. For example, your housing element is complete, so that's not a recurring cost. And some other things that we reduced that we thought really wouldn't affect operations significantly, but would result in significant savings to the town. One of the other main changes to the budget is we've consolidated what we've for formerly referred to as volunteer recreation and focus into a new department called Recreation and Community Services. So in essence, that used to be focus, used to be in a separate revenue fund, that's now in the general fund. So all the expenses are in the general fund and all the revenues are in the general fund. There's no actually significant increase to expenses that's stayed about the same and same with revenues, but it's now all in the general fund. 
And one operational thing is we did add a new maintenance worker in the Department of Public Works. And whereby before we had a part-time position, this is a full-time position. So there's probably an increase of about $35,000 with that ad. Overall though, we don't see, we see revenues equaling expenditures. Uh, we believe we can continue to maintain general fund reserves or what we refer to as the fund balance at about $2 million. That's about or approximate 25% of the operating reserves, which is a council policy. Uh, for budget transparency purposes, we've also added the side fund line item to all the departments. So you can see what that impact is related to that specific department. And we've actually added two new funds. One fund captures what we refer to as Measure A transportation funding that we receive from TAM, and the other is Measure A park funding that we receive from the county. And that will actually allow everyone to track where those monies are committed. And actually be easier for us to track, to show people. Uh, in terms of some other things within the budget, uh, we're gonna be taking a look at fees with the issue of looking at cost recovery. Uh, that's something we need to look at, especially when it comes to our rental fees, such as for this facility or, or the ball field for Little League and the pavilion, and then planning and building fees. We haven't really taken a look at those fees in a while, so we're gonna take a look at that. Um, just a point of clarification in the proposed budget, there are some narratives and some different things that we're gonna need to revise. Obviously, we need to incorporate some of the council discussion items that were discussed at the workshop, and we still need to do that. But again, the bottom line is revenues will equal expenditures, and we don't see a need to tap into the general fund reserves. Uh, just a clarification, I think you mentioned at the budget workshop that these numbers do not reflect the labor negotiations going on right now, so we could have higher expenses? Uh, that could be the case. Uh, the budget proposed budget does pr put in an allocation or allowance for MOU negotiations. Uh, we hope to have those completed by the time you adopt the budget, and then we'll actually be able to see if our allowance was able to capture the costs, or if it's an increase or decrease, it just depends. Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of the five-year forecasts, which is the next slide, uh, basically, this slide shows that expenditures and revenues are slated to match each other over the five-year period. Not going to be much of a surplus, but I think we're able to, again, match revenues to expenditures and not tap in the fund balance, get a better idea of the numbers. Table A, which is the table actually contained in the budget, shows the projections. And in essence, what this shows over the five-year period is that you know, we'd be adding to the general fund anywhere from 19 to seven thousand dollars. Not not very much, but at least we're not being we're not tapping in to the um, to, into the fund balance. And this does make projections on health care costs at nine percent a year and retirement going up at six and a half percent. And it also is assuming that the sales tax would be renewed. Uh, yes, and we'll get to that when it comes to future funding issues. But yes, it assumes the half cent sales tax would be renewed in uh, fiscal year 2017. And also assumes that Measure J would be renewed again in a few years? Uh, well, actually, in looking at it, Measure J actually falls outside okay. the uh, five year period, forecast okay. period. But it, it is something that we'll, we'll mention in the. I think it's discussion. up in fiscal year 18 19. Uh, well, it. The way it was, I think it was slated to expire in April of this year, so it takes over. So it, it might be, in looking at it, we I thought it fell out the five-year period. But that being said, we have a number. Uh, we could talk about that when you talk about future funding issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then we go to table B, which just shows how we based it, what we based our projections are. And in essence, you can see revenues are projected to go up by about 3% a year and general fund expenditures to go up by about 3% a year or slightly less on the average. In terms of council revisions from their your budget workshop on May 28th, uh, the council actually added $6,000 to trail improvements. Um, in the Measure A subcommittee in their work plan, they had proposed 24,000 for trail improvements. Council actually added another 6,000 in Measure J money for a total of 30,000 for trail improvements. Uh, measure A work plan was adjusted to allow more for park repair. We're actually not gonna go over the specifics of that because the actual work plan will go to the council in July and you can talk about that then. 
Council did add a total of $2,000 for youth and senior programs to increase that. Council also added a sidewalk repair program and funding for new downtown recycling containers. We indicated that we would capture that within the existing CIP budget. Um, Council talked about part-time staff for planning, building, and engineering intern. Again, we found that we'll be able to, we do have money for something like that in the different aspects of the budget, which don't require any budget increase. And one of the things that I just noticed, but I wasn't too sure in talking to Michael, is at the workshop, we talked about augmenting the volunteer activities by $2,000, but I can't recall if the council at the workshop actually said you wanted to do that yeah. or you wanted to talk about what it. What we talked about was adding 2000 uh, the volunteers had asked for an a, a additional 2000 as kind of a one-time augmentation, and we agreed to that um, when we talked about that. And then also another thing we talked about was adding one-quarter FTE admin assistant. That's what I listed as, that's what I refer to as part-time staff for planning and building. Oh, okay. That, Thank that's you. How I, that's just how I characterize Thank it. Thank you. Okay, and now on to the five-year capital improvement program. It's a total of $1.7 uh, It does reflect how we spend the money. So does, if design takes two years, we're actually allocating it over a two-year period. All the bridge projects, Marin, Spruce, Canyon, Creek, and Meadow are still in there. It actually, those projects for design or whatever the environmental cost would cost, it represents about one third of the total CIP. One item of note, Azalea Bridge, that's no longer in the CIP for 1516. We're anticipating that perhaps Caltrans will approve that project in fiscal years 17, 18. Um, we did add the class one bike lane to complete the bike spine. That's the completing the bike spine from Glen to Lefty Gomez Field. Um, we received a grant, and so that's in the CIP. We actually hope to also begin the parquet project. I mean, there'll be a process for that, but we're hopeful we can actually begin that process. And we have budgeted money to replace the roof for the pavilion, and we're hopeful that perhaps we can begin some of the more, call it the environmental analysis for the pavilion size and retrofit project. In terms of the women's club, we do have money in for the women's club. Uh, install ADA lift with the plan of making the stage ADA accessible. What will happen is all the permanent dais and the blue wall will go away, be replaced with a curtain and the town logo, movable tables that we could create a dais, um, and that will make the stage more usable. We do have money also to repair the roof over the kitchen, and we do have some additional funding in which we said we would take a look at the lights or some other type of repairs to the women's club. And in terms of streets, uh, this year most of our street maintenance funds will be focused more on maintenance such as slurry seal to extend the life of streets and what we refer to as thermoplastic striping in different areas of town. That ultimately will save on maintenance because the guys won't have to go out there and restripe it every two years. Uh, in terms of parks and trail improvements, we actually added a CIP slide that will have more detail, but in essence that's Generally, it's primarily funded with Measure A funding and a little of Measure J. In terms of the future funding issues to consider, again, as mentioned by the council, Measure D, your half-cent half sales tax, is slated to expire in April 2017. In terms of Measure J, the special municipal tax, which was just renewed, we had it expiring in November 2020. Maybe that we could check. Maybe that's the wrong year. Maybe it's 2019. Um, Oh, okay, could be June 2020, but we'll, we'll double check on that. Uh, and one of the things to think about is uh, should we continue subsidizing activities or really seek 100% cost recovery? For example, recreation services are not 100% cost recovery. And although this isn't necessarily cost recovery, uh, allowing overnight parking in the different areas does impact revenue because we may no longer require special permits or we won't issue as many fines. So those are things to just keep, keep in mind in the future. And one of the positive things is while we, right now we have two side funds with CalPERS, the shorter, we call it the smaller side fund, that's slated to be paid in five years. So in five years, you'll have a lump sum, you'll have, call it funding, a large sum of funding available for other type uses at that time since the one side fund will be repaid. 
in what we I, do. I thought we had, so we have one that will be completed in five years and one that will be completed in six and then we have this new one. Uh, actually, we have one that will be completed in five or six years and then the new one, which is more like 20 years. I thought the miscellaneous was five years and the safety is about six years. Uh, I think they're, well, we can look. It's okay. so test technically, there's, I call it one side fund, but yes, there's a smaller side fund that includes miscellaneous and, and safety, and that will be repaid in five, six years. Okay, thanks. And then the next slide is just putting numbers to some of the things to think about in the future. So what this does is it shows in fiscal year 17, 18, what happens to your fund balance if Measure D were not renewed, and that's the half cent sales tax, so you could see that in fiscal year 17, 18, you'll have about a 450,000 hit to your general fund reserve. You could see that obviously that's a large chunk. It brings you down below 20%. But more importantly, you could see that just wouldn't be sustainable over the long term. Um, you would need to do something. And it, actually, when I look at this slide, it looks like the numbers aren't adding up properly because the reserve balance would fall rather quickly at that rate. But what that means is it's just something to think about in the future. In terms of other numbers for future funding options to consider, and actually the slide on there is slightly different from the version you have in front of you, because this slide here just shows what the total numbers are. So if you were to renew Measure D in fiscal year 1718, that's about 450,000. If you increase your utility tax by 1%, because right now it's up to five, but we set it at four, that'd be another 100,000. Parking revenue, we're going to have to have a parking discussion, managed parking discussion is part of the town center element. And within that, one untapped resource is parking revenue. This is just a number based on if you were to generate 5,000 every weekend. It's, at this point, it'd be hard to say how much you could generate, but I would think these are rather conservative numbers. Um, increased fees and permits, that's just taking a guess. If you slowly phased in 100% cost recovery, perhaps what you can generate. And then the bottom number um, just says what the Total, total number would be and how it would add to your general fund reserves. But if you didn't renew Measure D and you did everything else, you still would have a rough negative uh, in those years to the tune of probably sixty-five dollars to $85,000, depending on how you wanted to calculate it. So in terms of that, that pretty much concludes the staff report. Um, really, we're asking to conduct a public hearing and that you just give direction, but ultimately the budget would come back to you for approval on July 15th. So with that, finance director and myself are available to answer any questions. Okay, so I'll bring it back to the council. Um, council members have questions. Uh, Renee, did you have a question? Um, <clears throat> yeah, actually it's probably more of a comment at this point. Um, and that is that this is a very dense budget and we had, um, you know, a two hour workshop. Um, and uh, as I went back and reviewed after I got some more, oh, it went so fast, it seemed like two. It was four. Um, I, nonetheless, um, very dense. Um, lots of uh, programs that are new, uh, lots of money allocated in different, in different directions and funds and a lot for me personally to, really take in and then to formulate my thoughts and then to make proposals and then for all of us to discuss. As I've gone back, um, I've actually recognized that I have a need um, to further those discussions. Um, and I'm wondering what form that may take. Um, I don't feel that by July 13th that I would be ready to make a, um, to vote on an approval. I understand that scheduling all of us for a workshop is a big deal. Um, I understand that it's a big deal. Um, we've had a lot of scheduling to do, but um, I do think that there are some allocations that I'm not clear about and some things I want to discuss further, such as uh, consulting services from public work directors and um, you know, look, looking at how we may allocate money to get more for, um, for what we do and for the amount of staff time spent on different things like public works director position. Um, and then funding some of the projects in town that serve the people right now, um, which I think sometimes we're under allocating to. Um, in doing a little bit of research, I understand that keeping a reserve of 25% is 
a very good idea, and yet I do understand also it's rather conservative. Um, and I've asked around a little bit. So I just want to look at what kind of things could we fund potentially that have been asked for um, if we were to revisit and discuss some of those things in a little more depth. So that would be something that I wanted to put out on the table. Uh, John? Yeah, and um, yeah, looking back over the budget workshop, you know, and I guess, yeah, it was four hours. and. Um, and we got about a third of the way, you know, some, I'm, it's hard to measure. And we were, we all had a lot of questions and a lot of comments and we were, you know, dragging through and we're coming towards the end of our four hours and we're being about a third of the way through, you know, then we started to go rapid fire. But basically, you know, no comments really aside from a few passing ones were there, no questions. I mean, I've got tons of little flags and questions to written that I never really got a chance. We kind of went rapid fire through the, the remainder part of the budget and then didn't quite get to the CIP all the way. Um, but overall, looking at it, I mean, I, I think I would ag agree with my colleague Renee in that, um, you know, we've, we've got two major hits here that we have not had in past years. You know, one of them is, is you know, an increase in what the stays requiring for us to do for the fire. Um, CalPERS, $230,000, that's another huge hit that we were not having to deal with before. I mean, that's a total of 360, even before we um, come out of the na labor negotiations. Um, $360,000 that we're trying to allocate from all these other areas and cutting things around. I mean, it's good to be as efficient as possible, but basically, what we're trying to do is keep that reserve fund exactly at that, you know, it's actually even over, I think it's 26% uh, project, a little over 26%. You know, we're kind of conservatively aiming, aiming at 25. Um, that to me says, you know, we are, uh, I believe being penny wise and pound foolish in that a lot of the other things that we are cutting are things that pay off. For instance, the volunteer program, is you get a huge bang for the buck. I mean, basically, you are leveraging that through members of the community. Um, uh, you know, you're taking not that much money and getting a lot more back for it. I mean, through the volunteer chipper program, that's one of the examples of that. Um, you know, we've also got a you know a trail program that you know is off to a start, and that's cut cut significantly. I mean, we're rolling some from this year's budget into next year's. That's close to what half that is. We did add a little bit more in there, I mean, because I was adamant at that point, and I think some of my <coughs> fellow cons uh, council members are too, as well as members of the public, um, that that's an important project because it helps people get around, and it's become crucially important if there's any major disaster, like an earthquake or a fire or anything like that. It's really how people can get out. That's why as few as 50 people died in the Oakland fire. I mean, they were expecting, they had a trail system there, and that's how a lot of people got out. And I heard figures around 350 people would have died without that trail system intact. And our system is about, you know, it, it needs a lot of work. Um, and I think that's an important way to spend some of our money. but. Basically, this hit of 360,000 plus is coming at the expense of these other things. I mean, they, they were cut a lot of other expenses, but I think that we should really look at that uh, general um, fund reserve. I mean, the, the previous year we spent $185,000 out of that, and you know that's basically how you make ends meet. Um, it's nice to put savings away for, it's a rainy day fund for in case we get a flood or earthquake or something like that. It's, it's an important thing to have there, but we can't only think about a what if kind of thing. We have a lot of community needs that are right now that need funding and frankly, it's a lot of bang for the buck. Um, you know, we took a quarter position last year and $10,000 and put that, you know, discontinued somebody who's really only working half a day a week uh, on the Center Boulevard project and put that towards volunteer efforts. Um, and that's basically for materials 
for wood chips and stuff like that. And then basically people who care about the town are working as volunteers to spruce up our downtown. They've done tons of weeding, tons of managing plants there. It's a huge bang for the buck. I mean, you could not get that for 10 grand. Um, that's So phenomenal. John, are you proposing another uh, I, meeting to discuss I the budget? I think budgets? we need another budget budget workshop as difficult as it is to schedule everybody I mean yeah. okay well it's could um, be another couple of I and mean, we got a third of the way through in the four hours I, maybe I don't, it's two more well let's let's kind of think about yeah. I know you don't want to show you don't I, have to I, show I, up yeah it's really it, we have historically over the last couple of years had a budget workshop and at least well two as I can recall meetings like this why don't we, instead of having a tremendous amount of other important things on the agenda, why don't we set aside our July meeting um, for a substantial conversation about this rather than the budget workshop, which historically gets under attended. I think there were only maybe 10 or 12 people that showed up for it at most. Um, that would be my recommendation on this. Sitting here hearing the comments on the reserve fund, however, is, is beginning to concern me. Uh, particularly because we live on the edge of a lot of acreage that hasn't burned in the lifetime of many people still living on Earth. Um, the flood situation has not been completely rectified, and there's always the looming concern of an earthquake. Um, having sat here in the aftermath of the 05 experience, that could turn out to be a light touch. We had enough money at that time to get by. Um, we were not supported and continue to this day not to have been completely repaid by FEMA. Contractors expect to be paid. People expect to be repaid. The work that we have to do to rebuild the town in the event of something even more catastrophic than the 2005 flood, we have to have the money aside. I made mention of the fact in the last meeting that all of us are good liberals. All of the programs that have been discussed tonight and hundreds of others really deserve great attention and full funding, but we can't do all of that. And it's not blithely, um, I, th I, I think we are blithely ignorant if we simply say, we will get more bang for the buck if we do X, Y, and Z. What we, we certainly will get a lot of benefit from all of these other projects across the myriad spectrum of things that we would like to accomplish. But without the money in the bank to keep us going during the I think we can believe um, some bad October afternoon or some bad December or January day, um, we're going to be up the creek without a paddle. I'd be very cautious about res uh, reducing those reserves. I think we'll let Peter. You know, if I may. Okay. I, I, I think it's irresponsible to take whatever it is, 100 grand, 200 grand, and put it in the bank instead of fixing our trails and keeping it safe for our populace. You're going to have people dying because you didn't do that and because you, you wanted to put the money in the bank? Not to put the, to put I mean, the money got, in the bank. You've got two million bucks there. To put, wait a minute. You put the money in the bank in anticipation of the recovery efforts that you have to make to put the town back. Uh, That's I, why it's there. I think, um, okay, one of the things I want to we remind there. people is it's okay to disagree. Um, Peter, did you have any comments? Because I do. If yeah, just very briefly, uh, a lot, we went over a lot of details, and, and I think it, it would actually warrant another workshop to get through all the issues. Um, one, one item that I, I wanted to uh, just mention um, along lines of what uh, John was mentioning, um, uh, the Gardeners Alliance, um, I got a, a, we received an email from Melanie Paratus, and she, uh, you know, discussing all the improvements that John was touching on. And I think that is an example of really being able to leverage uh, uh, a s relatively small amount of funds for materials that uh, really pays off in a big way that if you, uh, we don't have the public works budget that a lot of towns have. And I, I think that's a really, uh, good use of money to support uh, the Gardeners Alliance volunteer labor budget for materials um, and I think we can get a lot of uh, benefit out of that and I, I also wanted to just see if perhaps we can um, somehow uh, if their measure a funds might be available for materials uh, for uh, the Gardeners Alliance to make these volunteer improvements around the town, just putting that out there. 
uh, as a, a possible thought in terms of sort of a, a lot of the budgeting is being creative and figuring out where we can get funds, move them around uh, from various sources to um, various other uses. So I just want to kind of put that out there as one um, just specific thing that uh, we might want to consider. Okay, Renee had a brief thought, and then I'd like to make. I, a ju few I just comments. wanted to use an, as an example that um, I, I happen to know that San Anselmo has a 10% reserve um, on their budget, which sounded incredibly low to me, obviously. Um, but I was told that the 2006 flood they went through, in terms of the recovery and the money that they needed for their rainy day fund, it covered what they needed to adequately, and a lot of it was because they had. They have a large public works department. They were able to get to FEMA. They were able to get to the insurance money. They were able to get the applications in and procure that money in order to rebuild um, in a, a very, very quickly. So I'm not advocating for a 10% reserve. But even if we looked at 2% lower, we could free up money that would allow for more than $6,500 for all of our benches and to repave the basketball court. We need. Um, we don't need a ton of money for that. We need, you know, 10 instead of six kind of thing. So I just want, I think that this warrants a conversation um, and I'm not talking radical, but I am talking about something that frees up the money for the people who pay the taxes today. Okay, so I wanna make a comment and then I will open it up to the public. So a couple of things, Renee, I know a number of the um, business owners in San Anselmo and they actually sued the town because the town did not help them at all. And so I think um, there's a discrepancy necessarily in thoughts about what happened there, but I know Fairfax, and I was not on the council at the time, of course David was, uh, really stepped up and helped people, because that's what we do here. But I will say a couple of things. Um, I worked in the state for many years with very large budgets, but not enough money to do anything. And while David and I don't always agree, I'm in full agreement that we need to maintain that reserve. I think it is not penny wise and pound foolish to uh, rip out money from that reserve because we will have a disaster where we will need those funds. And FEMA is notorious of not paying back. It's not Fairfax. It's not that San Anselmo has been so successful. I worked in the state dealing with the flood statewide and the emergency response and delivering body bags for the Cypress structure for the people who died. And we did not, we could not get the money back after all the documentation and people in the state know how to do that. So I, I'm in agreement that potentially, even with four hours, we didn't have enough time. But I think we also need to look at this and say, you know, we're looking at a budget of about $8 million. We have a lot to do, and we can't do everything. And I will also say I'm working on the trails project, and, I'll, and I'm happy we're, we're working on that, but a lot of those trails have encroachment issues, so we can't even if we threw a million dollars at it, we couldn't get many of them done because of the encroachment issues which we're trying to work through. So I will say, I, I kind of like David's idea of potentially having not a full plate for the July agenda and having more discussion on the budget than because trying to schedule another meeting will be very difficult with vacations and such as well as our residents who also have other things that they have planned for the summer. So with that, I would like to open it up to the public. Can, can, I'm sorry, Barbara. Garrett, do we have a lot on the plate already for July? Well, as you only eat, meet months a month, it always gets filled up. I, I, I would know. suggest if you prefer to have future budget discussions on July 17th, you would not adopt the budget on July 17th because staff, it's would July 15th, 15th. I'm sorry, 15th, because staff would have to incorporate all those comments. That means it would come back to you in August. So as long as you have an understanding that you're not gonna adopt the budget in July because one of the policies is to try to adopt the budget as close to the fiscal year as possible, then I think that's fine. Another comment when it comes to reserves is that 
It's okay if you want to spend reserves, but they really should only be on one-time expenses because that's going to carry through the budget. And so my calculation is every 1% of reserves is about $80,000 is generally how it, it works off our calculation. I think one of the other comments too is normally for most towns, and I'm not sure what San Selma is doing, but generally for smaller communities, you need at least a 15% reserve just for cash flow purposes. And so I would recommend you never go below that. But if you wanted to tap in one or two percent for capital projects on a one-time basis, I think that's I've, fine. Garrett, I think we have been shown that there are a lot of one-time projects that would make a significant difference. And so that's along the lines of what I'm talking about. So thank Yeah, I mean, there's... I think we really should open it up to the public. Well, there have been people that have been waiting, and then we also have people waiting for... Yeah, well, I'd also like them to hear this piece. Um, we also have people waiting for the noise ordinance. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I'd just like to make a point that wasn't made by my other colleagues here, and that's in terms of the public work director. I guess you touched on it, Renee. Um, but one of the other things that public directors do is they go after grants and they identify a lot of things. You've got somebody there in that seat all the time, and that's one of the things that they do. Sean Condry over in San Anselmo does a phenomenal job, and that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a lot of infrastructure improvement there is that he is identifying grants, he's getting them, and he's bringing money into the town. And so the way I'm looking at the way that proud, uh, public works director's job is being divided up right now, Garrett's doing some of it, Mark Lockerbie's doing some of it. Uh, frankly, Renee and I are doing some of it. Um, you know, I mean, that's a pretty good bang for the buck, I suppose. But um, but it's not very efficient. And if you have one person who's there and they, they've got, um, you know, that, that could be something that would pay dividends in other ways. You know, you could hire a, a grant writer in particular to just focus on that, and that would be another approach to get something back. Um, I also can't... Let it go by. The, the flood event that happened, I mean, the relief to businesses in San Anselmo, you know, being a problem. I mean, I know in that 05 flood, I worked together with a lot of other people. There were hundreds of volunteers that were mopping mud out of businesses and doing all kinds of stuff all over town. And, you know, it was a phenomenal outpouring of help, of people in this community helping each other recover from that flood and uh, you know i i take issue with the fact i mean you can't throw you know money in the bank to pay contractors or something like that you really have to support your volunteer network and that's really what makes fairfax great um it was amazing the outpouring of efforts to really help our community in after that event and i think that's why you didn't see people suing their town because they didn't do anything. Because frankly, I saw the volunteers doing a lot and I didn't really see the town doing a whole lot. So, I mean, rebuilding bridges afterwards, that's something else again. Okay, well, I wanna open it to public comment, but also make a quick note that Garrett has been successful in obtaining many grants um, and he doesn't really spend a lot of time talking about that. But the bike spine was one of those with John's help on town. So with that, let's open it to public comment. Holly, can you press the button? Well, anyway, John took my whole speech, so um, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm a little discombobulated because I had it organized, but I have a couple of questions um, that I didn't realize had happened at the um, at the workshop that Garrett mentioned the augmentation for some of the volunteer activities. There's more money that, that was added that's not in the document that I looked at online. Is that true? So there's a couple things, Holly, I'll just answer that. Um, the volunteers that asked for something like a 2,000 additional kind of one-time allocation, the council agreed to that. And then when we were um, discussing the trails, um, Measure A had allocated something like 24,000 and I asked that we take 6,000 from Measure J. There was a lot of discussion, John brought a lot of good points up. I ask that we take 6,000 for Measure J to put to the trails project. So if that's helpful. Uh, yeah, that, that's helpful. And then there was another um, thing mentioned about adding a quarter 
of an admin position um, that wasn't for the volunteers that was for town staff overall because uh. um, we have one admin assistant and the idea was to have a little more ad admin help okay because we had ad we had asked for a 50 percent increase basically we had talked um, on numerous occasions about the strengths of the various um, three gals who work for park and and the volunteers and sort of spreading the wealth of the skills around and um, so I don't the way I'm reading it I don't think we got that I think we got actually a decrease um, so I would like to um, advocate for you to rethink that um, and I wanted to just read from um, the Measure J uh, ballot statement, quote, support and improve pedestrian trail maintenance program and to provide alternate exit routes in a wildfire. So that's something that we really highlighted. And I mean, 6,000, um, I'm not sure that's, uh, it, we've decreased the amount for the trails um, overall. So, um, even though we pulled some money from Measure J, I, I'm not, it doesn't seem like it's um, really doing what we said we were gonna do in that regard. Um, so we'd also, in, on the volunteers wish list, which we appreciated being asked, um, even though we really didn't get everything, um, we had talked about uh, money for grant writing, and I know Mill Valley has a really good model um, for um, having hired a grant writer, I think they got like six hundred thousand dollars for their trail program, which I think might do the trick here. If I think, um, Holly, one of the things we did was I asked for, to have like a civil engineering intern that they would hire that would help um, write grants and look for grants rather than allocating them specifically to the volunteers. Hence. Yeah, yeah. We, however, the grant writing happens. I think. We would be in favor of that part. Um, let's see, what else? Um, oh, I did want to mention, um, we've been doing a lot of talking about leveraging money and bang for the buck. And I mean, Fairfax, as we always say, is so unique. And um, I'll reiterate, you know, John did an amazing job heading up the, um, the effort after the flood. Um, but there, you know, there's a lot of other things um, as far as the bang for the buck. and. Um, the volunteer park, as we're calling it, you guys may know it as Bragman Corner, but we changed the name because Larry didn't want it to say Bragman. Um, and then John told us it used to be a Bragman, it used to be a volunteer uh, center there. So um, anyway, it's called Volunteer Park. That was probably about the same amount of work that I assume needs to be done at the park that you allocated twelve thousand dollars for. So. Um, we spent relatively zero dollars because the neighborhood, you know, people got involved. We raised money to put the bench in because people had the interest to do it. And um, we did the work day and then we actually got a bonus time of um, some of the public works folks. So that obviously did cost money, but we didn't, we didn't plan for that part except for them dropping the chips. So I just like to offer uh, for the volunteers if you want to partner and save some money on projects like that um, Perhaps you could reallocate the saved money to one of our other items that I'm a big fan of I took a picture of the um, doggy solution <laughs> stations that they have in San Anselmo and So they're an all-in-one and they're awesome and they're about a thousand dollars each but if we did you know three per year and I think we would be done with the whole town and everyone could stop complaining about the doggy solution issues that we're having. Um, and I have a picture if anyone wants to see it. It's, I'm a big fan. Um, I think that's everything. I have, um, you know, there's a bunch of people from the volunteer board here. I don't know if they want to say anything. But uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Holly. All right. Okay, others want to speak up? Helen? Well, oh, Helen Foss, 120 Scenic. I'm back again <laughs> to see you guys. Um, and on the same subject, um, because I really believe it's extremely important. Um, and um, 
that, that fire, the danger of a, of a giant wildfire in the hills is, um, is imminent. We've had four years of drought. Um, in fact, uh, David was instrumental in getting a wonderful DVD of, uh, put out by the fire department um, talking about exactly that, that we're long overdue for a major wildfire that will go from, could easily go from San Rafael to the coast. Um, and most of the people in Fairfax live up little windy streets. So in the case of a fire which is inevitable, and the fire department says it's inevitable, um, those people would be trapped because they're, they don't know how to get out on trails because partly that the trails don't exist, that they're, they're blocked, um, and there is an easy way, and I know that, that you two council members as, as trail committee members have, have um, devised an easy way to send out a letter to the people who have blocked trails so that we can get access. So it won't be a hard thing to do. The problem really is the funds to develop the trails. And the trails um, cost a, seem to cost about $10,000 per trail. And in the request that we sent, the, we, we identified 13 trails that would be really helpful, really instrumental in freeing up some of the major hillside neighborhoods so that people could get out and wouldn't be blocked by fire trucks coming up and cars coming down and that completely cuts off a neighborhood from fire department help. Um, I, I know I sound like a broken record to you, but um, I think we have a responsibility, a real responsibility to to the people who live in the hillsides. And it, you know, as I said, that's most of the people in, in Fairfax. So you know, we can't disregard them. We have to take care of them and, and ensure their safety. And that's sort of a minimal insurance of safety. Uh, to do what Mill Valley has done is, is really, really crucial. So I, what, I'm asked, what I think we need is in addition to the Measure A funds that we've allocated, um, $50,000 for, <clears throat> for trail development so that between those two funds we could um, approach half, we could really develop half of the, the 13 that we've identified. Um, and that would go a long way toward providing safety for our community. Um, that's all I think that I have to say. Thank but, you. But I think it's a really, really important thing, and I, I implore the council to reconsider. Thank you, Helen. Yeah. Melanie? Hi, Melanie Paradis, 25 Park Road, Fairfax Gardeners Alliance. Um, first, I just want to say thank you all for all the work you're doing on this. It sounds incredibly difficult and complicated, and I wouldn't want to do it for anything. Um, and thank you to the staff as well. Also, thank you to Public Works for all the help um, we have gotten when we've been doing the Gardeners Alliance projects. Um, that's been invaluable in terms of staff time and um, all the wood chips that we've gotten. Um, and I just wanted to make my case for the Gardeners Alliance um, for funding and continued funding. Um, as John mentioned, we are hoping to have the continued funding of approximately $10,000 a year, which was the money that was um, allocated for a contractor for the maintenance of Center Boulevard landscaping, which now we don't are not spending that money, um, and um, we would like to use that money going forward for the next couple of years for Center Boulevard specifically, and then we request that as continued funding for subsequent years for other projects that we will be continuing to do in the downtown area um, through the Gardeners Alliance. Um, and I think that's it. Mayor? Thank you. Thanks. Right, Can I ask yeah. staff a question? Sure. So, Garrett. Garrett? 
the money that was being spent for the prior um, gardening of the Center Boulevard um, area. What, what happened to that $10,000 that Melanie's talking about? It, what we did was, well, I can't specifically say if it was cut or anything, but that was just money that was in the street maintenance and public work. So if that's something that you specifically wanted to do, in looking at the numbers, I believe that the way we budgeted it is that could be incorporated within the existing budget. Sounds like the way to go. Uh, so, Gio, if you want to come up. Gio Taylor? George. You're up. George Taylor, uh, 100 Toyon. Um, I'm relatively new to the volunteer board. And uh, first of all, I'm very impressed with the kind of seamless interplay between the management of the town and the board the council and the volunteers it's really been amazing to be more involved in the workings and see the cooperation. There are occasional, you know, administrative glitches, but but I wanted to hit a couple of notes that are not specific to projects. One is I'm a mental health professional and one of the main reasons I'm interested in the volunteer board is because it is a conduit for community service. It's a conduit for generosity. It's a conduit for people looking out for each other. So a town that furthers that as a goal is a healthier town. And people feel more generous, they feel more creative, they buy more things, to contribute more tax money, et cetera. So um, that idea of creativity and building a healthy community together is one of the reasons why I'm interested in the volunteer board. And another reason, which is an even bigger picture for me, is that we all have our concerns about global warming and um, the economy, what's going to happen. And I think the best way that we and I could get ready for that is to know my neighbors, uh, know what kind of resources my neighbors have, know them by name, and know that we've worked together on community projects. So I think a, a strong community is the best defense against whatever catastrophe could come. Could it be a fire? It could be a flood. It could be changes in the economy and the political structure even. So I, I take a very long range view and say that this is the healthiest thing that I can think of doing for my community when I look into the distant future. And so I feel very, one of the things that um, impresses me the most about being in Fairfax is that other people share that value. And other people sense the strength of community is what's going to hold us together in the face of whatever is coming. So that's one of the reasons why I am join the board, uh, the volunteer board, and want to remain a part of this whole apparatus. And um, so I want to hit those two broader questions as you think about how you fund, you know, how do you fund? Um, I loved what John said about the, the most um, funding bang for your buck you know, is, is providing places for people to do service. That's an incredibly valuable use of town resources. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rose? Rose Tabor, 94 Hillside, Fairfax. I, I, I don't know if anybody spoke about this or I haven't, I didn't see it on the budget. You know, I'm a walker and if you walk, I've, been pleading with the council for probably 40, 50 years of adding a tax onto anyone who is remodeling and put that towards sidewalks. You have pedestrian and bike fund. Pedestrians and bikes do not use the same facilities. The uh, bike should be on the, uh, on the street and walkers should be on the sidewalk. If you try to walk in this town, there's no place to really walk. Try to take a wheelchair or a stroller. And I'm not talking about the hills. I'm just talking about the downtown area. And I'd like to see some funds go towards pedestrian. We've been promised streets downtown area now for, what, 40, some, 40, 50 years that I know of. And <clears throat> there were no, the funds were not put into Measure K to do that. And it, it's a dangerous, if you're not watching where you're walking downtown, it's dangerous. So it would be nice if we could find some funds 
to work on sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Mark Bell, 63 Dominga. A couple things. One, in the future projections on the budget, it was looking at $250,000 income a year from parking. So uh, uh, how does that figure come about? San Rafael spent, I don't know, $10 million on parking, and they say they broke even. So why did they even bother? I would probably even shop there if there weren't parking meters sitting in my way all at every place I try to go. Also, the other um, issue is I agree with David. Uh, you, have a, you have a contingency fund not only for natural disasters, but economic disasters like the bankers who amazingly still have their same jobs and are trying to repeal the measures that were taken for them gutting the world's economy with derivatives. Once that happens, you're looking at property taxes being slashed by 30% or so. And I think you need monies in reserve for uh, situations when the state decides they're going to take the property taxes that the town is due and hold them for three to five years. I forget what they can legally steal our money for. So um, maybe 25%. How much is it, 25% or 20 Garrett? Our policy is 25% in reserves. Yeah. yeah, so maybe, you know, each year take a look at 1% of that reserve and say, you know what, we really need to do the trails, for example. If we can knock off all the trails in two years, then maybe we should look at that seriously with 1% of the reserves and deal with it on a year-by-year -year basis. If you're looking at a one-time expenditure, I think it's better than looking at ongoing expenditures. So those are my points. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, other public comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Um, John, you look like your hands up. No? It doesn't have to be. <laughs> sure, I mean, I, I like the idea of leveraging these Measure A funds for the park at Klaus. I mean, it's basically the same size as the one park that we just did over the Cascades. Uh, and I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, I mean, I think that, well, we heard a lot of good things. I like what I hear. So um, uh, I think there's definitely support in this room that we've heard and certainly other people that are watching this on their computers or TV or whatever and other date that you should weigh in what you would like. Um, I guess, um, it, yeah, I think we need to build our community and we need to pay attention to that. I mean, it's, it's not just setting a reserve by, by supporting our community and by enhancing our network of, of people who share skills and get to know each other and care about each other, that's money in the bank. That's really what gives us resiliency. And that's, that's what I saw after the flood where, you know, we had hundreds of people basically digging people out of landslides, shoveling out businesses, things like that. That really made me proud to be a part of this town. And uh, I think that if we just see it in terms of dollars and cents and then conservatively like, oh, we got to save our money for contractors, well, th that's not the approach that I want to be a part of. So thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, Peter, or you, you know, you don't have to, I mean, I guess one of the things we discussed was the possibility of July not having a packed agenda for a change. And I suppose we could add another meeting at the end of July if we needed to do that. But with holiday vacations, that'll be tough. I guess one thing I'd like to say is, uh, if we have agreement on doing that and then moving towards adoption of a budget in August instead, um, one of the things maybe Garrett direction would be to take a look at, um, I think Holly said it best when she was talking about Measure J, a lot of what we sold Measure J on along with youth and senior programs in the capital projects were the trails. 
So let's see what we can do to increase uh, the trails. I think Helen was talking about another 25 or 50, I'm not sure, but um, we ought to look at, at what we could do coming back in July with, with more allocated there. I think Melanie talked about the 10,000 for the, the garden, the Gardener's Alliance, um, which feels a pretty good niche. Um, so maybe that's something we could come back with. I think you talked about maybe something like a 1% out of the reserves or something of that nature, 1.5% to do these one-time kinds of things. Um, and maybe we could have more discussion on some of these other things that council members have brought up. I think what I heard you say is though a long-term ex expense such as a public works director, which I've been advocating for a long time but have backed off given that we don't have the kind of resources for an ongoing sort of person, um, we can certainly discuss it, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that we really should be moving toward the direction of San Anselmo or other cities which have gone to a 10 or 15% reserve because that may be their way of approaching the future. I think our way of approaching the future is try to be safe so that it's not just about putting money in the bank for contractors. It's about having money when we need it. So it's a mix. Um, but I guess that was, what I would ask the council is do we definitely want to go forward with the idea of July having a more expanded budget discussion and bring some of these issues forward more so that you know we're fleshing things out a little bit more than what we did in the past or the prior workshop? You know, I, I would say that, that that's probably a good first step. Um, I don't think we're going to get anything on the calendar prior to that. So let's bring that and then um, let's see where we get. If, if we can allocate the right amount of time and we can get where we need to get, then we'll bring it back in August for, you know, approval. But let's take that as the first step would be my... Um, so do we, are you making a motion for that? Or do we well, need a motion? You, you don't need no. a motion. No, you, you just have to yeah. conduct the public hearing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I would support, you know, adding another, you know, doing that in July, and obviously there's going to be other things that we need to deal with, you know, and we'll add another one. I mean, there, it wasn't that many years ago when this council regularly approved budgets in the fall. I mean. It, we just passed an interim budget measure where we can do go ahead and continue on the same pattern that we're on now, which is not significantly different than this. Um, you know, where we hash out exactly where we want to go. I mean, there's it's it's good to have an adopted budget, obviously, but um, it doesn't have to happen in July or August even. Let's see what we can do. I think we should make every effort to get a budget as close as possible. And so I think Agreed. we have direction. And uh, Peter? Yeah, just two things. One, I'd, I'd be willing to do a, an extra meeting for a budget workshop. Um, this is my first experience with the budget process. It's, it's a lot of information. It's hard to uh, hit on everything in a real abbreviated way, especially if we have uh, other items on the agenda. And then, um, Garrett, I, I would like you to, to look into that $10,000 that uh, Melanie was talking about. You know, if you... I, I just gave him direction. He to, to, I asked him. And he said that the money had been allocated in the past and that it can be routed or rerouted. Am I putting words in your mouth or was that what you said? No, we can exorb it within the existing budget if that's the question. I, I mean, we had previously budgeted 10000 for maintenance, and I don't see that as an issue to okay. continue that. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of have a definitive... We'll specifically note it in the notes in resolution the budget. On that. Okay. I, I just want to remind that there was always a public works director here until when did we stop having a public works director? Nine. 2009. Yeah. Okay, and and I and just for, just for the record, um, Garrett and Mark, if you're listening, um, this is not this this is something to um, to free you up to do what it is you do so well, and you seem to do everything so well, 
but at the same time, I, I do a lot of work directly with Sean Condry only because of Safer to Schools and some of the infrastructure things, and I know what they are able to do, and it's a full-time job. You do three full-time jobs, so this is not to say that you don't get us the grants. You've done an extraordinary amount of, of, of great work, but I do think we, d we need to move it forward and have someone who really has all that on their radar. So um, it's not a separate budget workshop. This will be our meeting in July, July 15th, and uh, quite a bit of that meeting would be dedicated to discussing the budget and with the direction we gave staff to come back with uh, looking at other ways to fund some of these issues. So with that, we're going to move, uh, we're going to quickly reevaluate the agenda, but we are going to move on. We have a number of people here regarding the noise ordinance issues. But I just want to say a couple of things regarding the agenda. I think items 26 through 30 can be very quick. quick. And then I think we could potentially move 24 to the July meeting if we don't pack a lot of other things on that July meeting. Yes. And then I think we could potentially do 25 at the July meeting as well. Uh, so, Garrett, 24 and 25 are going to the July meeting with the direction that we're not adding a lot of stuff to the July meeting. Let's do no presentations. Let's just do the budget as, and very few items. If we, ha I think I asked for an, a, a presentation. I can move it. And uh, I don't, we'll, can, we'll do items 26 through 30 because we think they'll be relatively quick. Does that make sense? Okay. We're moving on. Thank you, everyone, who's been here for item 23. And, Garrett, do you want to do a, a quick um, staff report? Thank you, Mike, for staying. Appreciate it. So the item before you, um, as you know, is a discussion consideration of the residents' petition regarding the noise ordinance. Um, and obviously the council, you may recall, discussed this at your May meeting and then you continued it to this meeting. Uh, at the May meeting too, as part of this presentation, uh, you may recall the council member Reed volunteered to meet with the property owner, business owner, to kind of talk about some possible solutions or mitigation measures and I believe council member reads were reported that separate after the staff report. Um, you also directed staff to explore amendments to the limited commercial zone of which Deer Park falls into. We'll touch on that in the staff report. And we also, in terms of staff report, attached some, for reference material, some of the previous staff reports that the residents had requested. So with that, I thought it'd be important again to kind of go through how we got here, which is the historical background. So we started the discussion, we received the petition back in October 2013. And that original petition from the residents in the Deer Park neighborhood uh, concerned the noise ordinance and the enforcement of the town's ordinance as it related to uh, Deer Park Villa's outdoor events. Uh, the council, let's see, submitted a petition so the in seven years, uh, oh, okay, so I'm sorry. So at the October meeting, and the council did hear from the residents and at that time, staff was directed to hold a neighborhood meeting. We did have a neighborhood meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we reported back in February the council of results. Uh, council at that time asked if another meeting would, could be held. Uh, the business owner and the residents at that time decided that another meeting wasn't needed. In May of 2014, again, the council discussed the item as well as proposed revisions to the noise ordinance. Uh, you did not take any action at that time, but you asked that it be agendized for a future meeting. Uh, end of May, the residents in the Deer Park Air neighborhood submitted a second petition to the council concerning proposed revisions to the town's noise ordinance and enforcement. It was agendized for discussion in June, but due to time constraints was continued. The council actually discussed the matter at its August meeting last year, uh, directed staff to try to meet with the owner to see, to evaluate the status of the different improvements trying to be made at that time. He also asked us to research the town minutes regarding the noise zones and get more information on other facilities in the county. 
And so we did that. And then you continued matter to November. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. All that happened at the October meeting, the direction from the council. But as the owner could not, business owner could not make it to that meeting, you continued the matter to November 2014. At that meeting, uh, the owner indicated that perhaps there's a judgment against the city, in which time we could then continue that matter to January of this year to provide staff an opportunity to research the matter. So that brings us to tonight. So again, you discussed this in May. Um, one item of note is when we did our research, we discovered the town minutes indicated that a use permit had been issued in 1990, 1976 for Deer Park, which limited outdoor amplified music to 8.30 p.m. for nonprofit events and 10 p.m. for charity events. We were unable to find ever if that use permit was ever modified. And so we assume those provisions still apply, but we don't actually have a copy of the actual use permit or letter. So that remains out there in, in a possible issue. But that being said, we believe all options are available to the council. Briefly to touch on, we explored the option of modifying the limited commercial zone to restrict outdoor music. Should be noted that while you can modify the limited commercial zone, any changes you do to that would not affect the business that already has a use permit. They'd be grandfathered in, however, it would affect future businesses. So just wanted to point that out. So with that, again, in the staff report, some of the options that we had available was maintain the status quo, which is don't recommend any changes to the noise ordinance. Uh, option two, which we think is the best approach to this, is that we request the Planning Commission to conduct a public hearing to ratify the conditions of the use permit um, based on the town minutes and or make modifications as they deemed appropriate. Modifications could be adjustment to when amplified outdoor music would be allowed. I believe the town attorney can provide more information on that process if you need it. And then the other is if you want to make other changes to the noise control sections of noise ordinance, such as adjusting the day, daytime hours or the decimal levels or any combination thereof. Uh, we're actually not recommending the, that uh, one of the options, which is you, you know, combine noise zones. We think that just um, one of the purposes of the noise zone is to act as the buffer between commercial and residential. We think that should stay there. Under any scenario, we're recommending that we revise the enforcement provisions to make it clear, represent how the town is currently enforcing the ordinance. Um, and perhaps, you know, there are some different options there, but we think perhaps the best option is really you take a look and direct the planning commission to take a look at this use permit. And again, the town attorney could provide more information if you need. But that's basically the staff report available for questions and town attorney is also available. Um, did we want John to present his oh, yes. meeting with um, uh, the owner? Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, at the last meeting, as Garrett just noted in a very long history, um, <clears throat> I was instructed to meet with Mike Gearingelli and the two of us did meet um, on the uh, Saturday after that council meeting and uh, at Deer Park Villa and talked for a while um, along with uh, uh, Pete Gearingelli um, who happened to be there and you know um, so the three of us talked and um, we looked at the area uh, I presented um, some of my sound wall findings I took some pictures of the sound wall up at the Marin um, Civic Center uh, which is you know it's the kind of sound wall that you would want to have next to a wedding you know I mean it's basically um, black um, gardening cloth it's like felt it's maybe a quarter inch thick or so goes down forms tons of pockets all down the front of it and you basically take a potted plant you know pull it out of the plastic pot and wrap some more of this material around it and put it in these pockets and so you can, you know, if a plant needs maintenance, you can move that around. Um, and there's drip irrigation that basically makes this much heavier and sound tends to go into it and just kind of get soaked up. It's kind of like uh, the kind of material that you have in a redwood forest. And it looks pretty good. And, you know, I, I showed pictures of this to, to Mike and Pete and, and um, they liked the way it looked. Um, and, uh, you know, that, basically uh, 
you know, was something that could go along, um, if you will, along the edge of the drive going in. There's a hedge there, and then there's, you know, a, a, some grill work made out of um, some rebar with some hanging plants on it. And it would basically be in that place as a barrier between where the noise happens and where the residences are. And what Mike and I agreed towards the end would, you know, this would be basically this, the second phase because this, the construction of that is obviously fairly involved. And then I heard later from talking to Garrett that he would probably need a, a, a um, variance to build a wall of that height. Um, from the Planning Commission, I would encourage and hope that they would, you know, rubber stamp that because it makes a lot of sense to me. And it's really not blocking a neighbor's, well, it might be blocking a neighbor's view, but you might like that. Um, and that's, that's something that can't happen in the middle of, you know, it's a construction project, so they can't really happen in the middle of the, the wedding and celebrate, you know, the, the summer season, and basically it would be in the winter. Um, the other thing that was there, a sound engineer was brought in, and Mike, uh, he had earlier forwarded me a, um, a letter from that sound engineer where uh, four of his recommendations were listed in that letter, which was basically dealing with the sound. Um, it, you know, there's a concrete section in, in the middle that reflects sound, you know, basically covering that with something so it's a little bit more padded. Uh, basically having an in-house sound system so rather than having you know a couple of big speakers that DJs tend to bring in which project a lot of sound like that it's more of uh, and Mike provided a um, uh, a copy of well one thing that he got from uh, Bananas at Large which is a vendor of systems like this and, and this is an example of what they have and it's basically a lot of smaller speakers that are pointed more towards where the people are listening uh, so they're not big ones that kind of push it out and in general soak the area, but it's uh, more like a surround sound kind of situation. Um, and um, that was one of the recommendations was to use something like that that's less volume of sound, but in more, you know, right next to where people are and, you know, so you're not covering the whole area with a couple of points that go out broadly, but, you know, there's more, a lot of little points that are not so loud. Um, in addition um, to having this that, you know, the DJ uses um, or, you know, whoever's talking it, whether it's a celebration of life or, or a wedding or whatever, you know, that that sound is used, that's how sound system are, is, gets used instead of something that somebody else brings in. And if it's a good enough quality one, they're going to want to use something good like that. Um, in addition, uh, one of the recommendations from the sound engineer was, you know, and I don't, I haven't been able to look through this. I don't know if it's included in here or not. Um, but, you know, it was a vinyl, a weighted vinyl curtain. It's kind of like a flag. If you, if you had a light shining somewhere and you didn't want to go into your neighbor's yard, you'd put something on the side to keep the light from going in that direction. And that was something else that I think was in that letter. Um, and what Mike and I talked about was, you know, the, the needs of, his needs in terms of a business, in terms of having something that people could work with there in terms of what's needed to put on a wedding or, a, or, or some outside thing in that Redwood Grove and what it would take to have the neighbors be okay with that. And having the sound level decreased is obviously something that, you know, and, and having something that is a barrier that soaks up sound in between the neighbor's houses and this the redwood grove um, was you know the second stage so basically we figured it was a two-pronged approach the first prong is early you know and then basically you could go out and buy this you know probably not tomorrow but within you know it, it it's a matter of days um, to buy it something like this and set it up um, and the sound wall is kind of a stage two, and uh, that would happen in the winter. Um, and basically, I, I don't think Mike has, I, I, well, he told me earlier tonight that the contractor that he was gonna talk about getting a bid for the sound wall 
has not been able to give him a you know look go out there and meet with him yet um, but since that's the longer term half of the project um, that's probably reasonable obviously Mike needs to know how much of that's going to cost so he can make business decisions relative to that but in terms of the sound system and making it something that's producing less sound that's more structured so that it's the sound is getting to the guests but not the neighborhood um, is the short term half of it and that is the initial half of the fix so that's Thanks. the result of that meeting Thank you, John. Um, so I think maybe what we should do is um, let's let's open it for public comment now rather than having council discussions because we'll bring it back. And I know Mike also wants to present some of this information. So with that, let's open. Oh, did you have a quick yeah, question? Actually, I have a quick question, not not to get into discussion. So when you said that you were talking about the 1976 use permit, um, I was looking and in the code. Um, around principal permitted uses and structures in the CL zone. Um, it says that those use permits shall be granted for periods of no more than six months initially, um, and the Planning Commission may approve extensions. So my, my question is, does that mean that subsequent, well, we don't have the 1976 one, but do we have any record or anything in the minutes about anything being reviewed after the initial six months or any further review? As, as I recall, I believe in seven, I think the staff report indicates maybe in 78, the council actually considered um, eliminating outdoor amplified live music. Uh, subsequently, the property owners sued the town. No, yeah, but I'm just wondering in terms of that six months, if it says that after six months it must be reviewed, I wondered <clears throat> if we needed to find in the minutes if no if no actual I, use permit exists. There's, there's no evidence that the use permit has ever been reviewed since 1979. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that clarification. So let's open it up to public comment. Sorry, folks, you've waited a long time. So did people want to speak? Thank you. Uh, you have to push the button. Oh, sorry. I'm Marcia Custer, 12 Porteous. Um, first of all, thank you uh, to the town council and to staff for uh, going into such great depth and reading and understanding this. It's been a long 20 months since we started this journey. And um, I think what we really tried to do in October of uh, 2013 was ask the city council for clarification of, you know, what does you know what what is the ordinance is it being enforced properly and what's going on um, and I think you know we've kind of kicked the can enough and I think um, we really appreciate the fact that staff has uh, really analyzed this the way they have and we uh, I think I can speak for uh, a lot of people who signed the petition we really uh, appreciate your option number two to request that the Planning Commission conduct a public hearing to ratify the conditions of the use permit. Uh, we think that's, that's all we've been asking for from the beginning. What are the rules? The use permit was very clearly defined back in 1976. It disappeared, so let's go back to what the use permit is really for. It's, it's to allow somebody in a, in a limited commercial zone to have some, be able to do certain things, but we've lost that. So if we can just go back to have, a, have the Planning Commission public hearing, talk about it, let's bring it out in the open and say, okay, what, what is the best thing for Fairfax? Thank you. Okay, um, Michael McIntosh. Thank you. Um, if there was litigation on this matter, I would strongly suggest the town to review that because that language should be what's directing you here tonight. Further, if there was a use permit in place, whether you call it grandfathered or not, as long as it was not invalidated for some period of time for not being used, if you altered that, it would be in fact a taking. And as a taking, as I brought up to you for my own issues, there's due process. And these things require in every democracy that you go through these different procedures, which also evaluates what that taking is worth. So if we're going to take that path, you certainly can, 
but I think it's also an opportunity of where I know it's been a long time of trying to come to a resolution that's more favorable for all the parties and the parties would not be just the neighbors or just the business but also the town so you can look to try to build um, something that is consistent for all the noise violations whether it be our supermarket whether it be a business or in the future my business so if you really thought about looking at this on a broader basis you can incorporate when I come before you or anybody else comes before you so it's consistent but I would strongly avoid taking away a pre-existing condition which is in fact a taking thank you thank you Michael um, Bob did you want to speak up you've been very patient for several hours Thank you, I appreciate that comment. Uh, I agree with the comment uh, just made, uh, first of all, Bob Stemple, 42 Porteous. The idea of changing a use permit is taking. That's one of the reasons why I like so much the uh, petition that we presented uh, in May last month. We talked about changing the uh, principal permitted uses for the CL zone, which as it currently stands, and this was, th th this was amended in 84, it currently says that uh, uses shall be conducted entirely within a building. And it also says that no permitted use provided for this division shall include the entertainment of customers or clientele by music. And so what we proposed with our petition was to add rights as opposed to take them away. We thought that was a very fair approach. We would allow indoor amplified music. We would allow outdoor acoustical music until 8.30. We would allow the restaurant business to be conducted outdoors, which it currently is not according to this, uh, as long as it's a distance of 175 feet or more from a residential property. Now, of course, there's an issue of a, of a, uh, uh, a use permit which may exist or may not. No one can find it. Now, there are many reasons why it might not exist. For example, uh, it says also in the same um, uh, page I'm, I'm, I'm reading from your own town code. It says, use permit shall be granted for periods of no more than six months, which is what Renee said. It also says that, uh, 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 let's see, extensions can be approved, but in approving use permits and extensions, findings, findings must be made uh, that the use will not or has not created an increase in, among other things, noise. That's good enough reason to uh, think that probably uh, this was rescinded. I mean, clearly, uh, you even have, uh, Garrett, you guys have done, an, and, and Michelle, you've done an awful lot of research. You've been digging very deeply. And in one of the uh, staff reports, you actually included some of the comments from neighbors. I think Rose Tabor was quoted way back in 77, 78 as complaining about noise. So therefore, they did not, uh, it says, in approving permits and extensions, findings must be made that no negative effect on noise took place. Clearly, their uh, findings were made and showed that noise was affected. So th there's a question about whether or not the, uh, use, uh, the uh, uh, use permit, the conditional use permit exists or not. Still, in order to simplify things, uh, the uh, staff has presented uh, a list of um, possible options. And I agree with Marsha in that perhaps the best one to pursue is option number two. Option number two requires us to go to the Planning Commission and revisit the use permit. We might as well assume that the, uh, might as well be generous here and assume that the use permit exists. One of the reasons why I think that that is the best way to go is because I read uh, the analysis that uh, uh, Garrett wrote up about the difficulties of amending the, uh, the zoning ordinance as opposed to amending a use permit. There are certain difficulties involved. I uh, do not uh, understand or agree 100% with them, and rather than bringing up all these issues, I would like to request to have a meeting with the, with the uh, town attorney. Uh, so that this doesn't take up a lot of time here to find out whether or not I understand things clearly or not, because there are some issues that may, the uh, option of um, changing the zoning uh, as opposed to changing the use permit may actually be beneficial to the town, and I would like to address that. I so have some let me just mention sure. one thing. So Bob, the attorney is actually the council's attorney, and so what I would suggest to you, if you have questions, you would send those in to Garrett, and he'll get the answers to you. We can't have a separate meeting with the town attorney because she represents the council, so she is not available for consultation I, I with members of the public. Okay, the reason why I say that is, is that she offered to meet with uh, the attorney uh, of the uh, Gear and Gilly uh, business uh, last 
in May, and so I thought that perhaps it would be appropriate to ask well, that's, for the same. Well, that's representing the council, okay. and that's meeting with another attorney. Okay. So I think if you want to send those questions to Garrett, he'll get back to you, and okay. he may consult with Janet in that as well, okay? okay I, I understand the difference now. Uh, uh, the problem with taking this to the Planning Commission is, of course, it is going to be the equivalent of kicking the can down the street even further. It means that we're not going to get any resolution immediately. There are going to be multiple steps before it eventually is brought back to you and, and is open for a vote. And so I would like, in the, in the meantime, for um, uh, some measures that could be effective immediately to give the neighbors some type of relief. One would be to, in, uh, to enforce the use permit as it is stated from 1976. That would give us some help. Simply instruct staff to enforce the use permit. The other one would be to instruct, and this relates to the recommendation uh, number four. I'm sorry, I've got the numbers wrong here. Uh, the, uh, I believe it's n n number four, it refers to the, um, uh, what is referred to as the enforcement of the noise ordinance. I would like very much for the uh, uh, council to instruct staff to enforce the noise ordinance as it is written. I do not think that there is any reason to think that is unenforceable. The town code says that if there is a a, uh, uh, let's see, an amendment being considered or whatnot, the original version is supposed to be enforced in the meantime. I'd like to explain to you, I've, I've got some people here who have chosen not to speak in order to grant me more time. I'd like to try to, uh, try to explain to you why I think the, uh, uh, what's called the change for character of sound clause is not difficult to understand and it, is, it was enforced in 2013, it was enforced in 2012. I'm having difficulty with the fact that it's not been enforced, it hasn't been enforced for a year and a half. That would give us, uh, uh, to enforce it would give us uh, protection, it would give us some type of relief that could be effective immediately. So what I'm basically asking is, would you instruct staff to enforce the use permit, instruct st uh, uh, staff to enforce the, the noise ordinance as they are both written? Would you like to hear my explanation of why I think that the noise ordinance is enforceable and and, and uh, worthy? Or I, should I we don't just think we have time five. because uh, for a group you get five minutes. I think we've gone a little over that. Sure. So thank you. Thank you. Um, other folks wanting to speak on this item? Okay. If you'd like to speak, we're running late and I know you've been here for many hours, so I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, Barbara, so sorry. Um, Allison Mullikin, 60 Porteous. Um, I, I can take, I could just take up where Bob left off, which is the current noise ordinance states that in the, um, in the event that the offending noise is music or speech, that the decibel level should be lowered by five decibels. And in the first clause of the, of this, of the first part of this clause, which is called correction for character of sound, um, it, it says that in the judgment of the chief of police or his um, substitute, which would be an officer who would come out to judge, the judgment is, is the offending noise music or speech? And um, which seems to be a very simple, um, understanding that the officer would need to come out and judge that it is indeed music and speech that is coming from a Deer Park party. So in that event, the decibel level would be lowered by five decibels, and that's what we're asking for to be enforced. Um, and th that would give the residents of Deer Park Villa, Frustruck, Hillside, whatever, wherever people are who are hearing this ricocheting music and um, amplified speech, it would give us some relief for this summer, um, which I think there are, Mike mentioned there are 20 more parties planned for the summer. Um, so that is what we were talking about um, even a year and a half ago, and it seems like it, you know, has been interpreted in different ways, but if you really read it and, and take out some of the riveting and the hammering and all that, if you really just read it as music and speech, indeed it does say that this is supposed to be lowered by five decibels. And I believe it was put in there to protect people from that kind of um, repetitive, continuous noise. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, other folks wanting to speak on this matter? Amanda Martin, uh, 48 Myrna. I just wanted to say something from the other point of view. I, um, a Deer Park neighbor on Myrna, and in fact, um, we've been there for 18 years. My husband actually lived right next to Bob uh, for five years before that. And we don't feel like the sound level coming from Deer Park has ever been an issue. Um, and and the, the reason that I felt strongly enough to come here and say that to you tonight is because it it, it strikes me as so unfair to the Deer Park operation that a few neighbors can band together and because they're unhappy and um, become vocal about their, their unhappiness and be a vocal minority in the neighborhood um, that, th that it can that it has actually resulted in, in part, in the closing down of Deer Park and the layoff of the employees, um, the uh, obviously Mike Garangelli's um, income from the property, as well as Fairfax, the town of Fairfax's income from that property. And, and so I just wanted to bring that other opinion forward um, because it, it's not being heard um, and remind people that I really missed Deer Park being open. We loved going down there. That was date night. That was Friday night date night for my husband and myself. We would have cocktails and dinner down there. And to be able to walk there and the fact that it is in a, in a neighborhood and not downtown makes it even more special. And, and you can't you can't move that um, you can't move that venue you can't move that redwood grove. Um, it's special because of of where it is, um, and the fact that people can move into the neighborhood and buy their houses knowing that that's pre-existing, that's part of the neighborhood, that's been there for almost a hundred years, and and then try to change the character of the neighborhood. I, I don't think that's fair not only to the business, I don't think that's fair to the other neighbors who like having Deer Park operating. I mean, to me, it, it's, I would compare the music, I mean, it's music, it's happy music, for goodness sakes, you know, to similar to hearing the ball game and the announcer, you know, announcing the score and everybody applauding and cheering and, you know, it's, it's part of the, it's part of a community. It's more than part of Fairfax, it's part of the county. It's a, it's a treasure to the county where it's not just people from Fairfax who use it and have their significant commemorative events in their life there. In fact, Bob had his retirement party there. There are a lot of memories associated. So we're over the time if you want to wrap it up. I mean, appreciate your comments. Um, I, I guess the point I just want to come down to is, is the basic premise that they're arguing here seems, seems unfair. I don't even understand why it's gotten this far. Um, and, and just for you folks to hear that there are a lot of us out there with a different point of view Thank in, you. in the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Okay, others? Um, Mike, did you want to speak or did your um, council... Uh, it looks like no one else is stepping up. Um, yeah, Mike Garangelli, uh, Deer Park Villa. I'll give this over here so you guys can see this little report. Yeah, I think um, so. Mike asked me earlier, Michelle, if you could hand that out to us. That'd thanks, be great. thanks, Michelle. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, I did meet with the contractor, John. It's just he hasn't had time to put up his proposal yet. So we, we reviewed, and he's seen your pictures and things like that. Um, also, uh, as I said last time, I wanted to uh, be afforded the opportunity to consult with an attorney, my attorney, who's uh, here tonight. His name is Bill O'Connell. And uh, my suggestion was that my attorney talked to your attorney and 
um, the attempt to do that was was made. So at this point, although I want to, you know, come back and answer any questions or anything like that, and maybe have further comment, I'd like to um, have my attorney Bill McConnell come up here and, um, ex you know, kind of. I certainly don't agree with the analysis of your attorney, um, and let him give you a point of view that uh, represents my point of view from a legal standpoint. Thanks. Before we do that, Mike, um, you've handed out the proposal from Bananas at Large or Pictures, and was your um, idea that you would move to uh, put this together in the next few weeks before July 1, something like that. So with your number of parties that are coming up, these mitigation would be in effect very soon? Well, well, the, the um, idea of what, you're, what you see in front of you is probably the first step we'll be able to take. I've still got to look into, um, you know, paying for it and all that kind of stuff. So, but the answer is that would be the first step that we would take to and, uh, and what's, do something similar to what you're looking at there. And what's there. the timing of that? I don't have a, a timeline quite yet, but it would be, you know, the first thing we do over the next few months. Okay, the next few months, and then there's a number of parties that would be happening very soon, is that? There's, some parties, yes. Okay. Of course. All right. Thank you. And we've already been having parties, by the way, so I'm not really sure if anyone heard them or not, but uh, we've we've had them. Okay. Here, here's Mr. O'Connell. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm new to this matter. It's been going on for a long time. You might want to just state your name because. Oh, okay. My name is Bill O'Connell. I'm and a lawyer. You, you don't need to, you, you can probably speak a little lower. I, I have been accused of having a <laughs> booming voice. I'll try to control myself. Um, uh, I'm a lawyer practicing here in, in San Rafael. Um, and Mike consulted with me after uh, the last meeting. I'm new to this matter. It's obviously gone on for a long time. Frankly, my sense is that or, or my hope would be that this could be uh, resolved in some kind of a commonsensical, um, amicable manner. Uh, but lawyers being lawyers, um, I'll, I'll move away from that wish and make a few uh, legal points that I think are very important to bring to the fore and make a part of the record. Um, the, the use permit was granted on May 24, May 24, um, 1976. I've got the exact text of it here. It's available in the minutes of, of the town council. So there's no question, number one, that there is a use permit, number two, that it was granted, number three, that it is not time limited, and number four, what the conditions are. I, I could read it, uh, but um, I, I will instead just briefly summarize that, that it was a permit allowing um, outdoor music, amplified outdoor music and entertainment, uh, uh, a live entertainment permit. But as uh, Attorney Colson and I, the town attorney, have discussed, it's clearly a use permit. The, the first point I need to make is that there is ample and, and clear state law as well as reflections of that state law in the Fairfax code of ordinances that a use permit is a vested right. And, and I use that not in a colloquial sense, but in a technical legal sense. Uh, to, to put it plainly, a vested right means you can't take it away. It is a right that the permittee, the, the recipient of the permit has, and once it is granted and acted upon, and it was granted some uh, what, 39 years ago, and it has been acted on, and it's still in effect, um, so it is a vested right. It's, it, no right is complete and absolute. There are exceptions. Uh, the, the principal exception, and almost 
the only exception that any of the reported cases ever deal with is if a public nuisance is created, um, then that vested right in that extraordinary situation can be revoked. Um, I, I've spoken, as I say, to Attorney Colson and written to her, and I'll just, um, because I think it's said more clearly than I might paraphrase it, um, say what, what um, the law is. I'm quoting a, a, a treatise on California um, uh, pleading and practice, and it says, and I'm quoting, the issue of noise as a public nuisance creates a clear example of the court striving to balance the right to the comfortable enjoyment of property with the right to use property for legitimate business purposes. Contiguous property owners must to a reasonable, reasonable degree yield their desire for privacy to the general welfare which is contributed to by the operation of legitimate businesses. Nothing could be more squarely on point. But, the, but um, from there, you have to go to a factual determination. Well, that's fine to state that general legal principle, but has Deer Park Villa crossed over the line? And it's clear that they have not. They've operated under this permit consistently and in the same manner, using amplified outdoor music for well in excess of 30 years. As, as members of the council themselves remarked at the May hearing, they've complied both with the terms of the permit and with, with the noise ordinance for all of these years. Um, and as, as has been pointed out, not only is it not a nuisance or not some surprising, annoying, uh, inappropriate uh, um, type of operation, but it's one that all of those who complain about it knew about it when they bought their houses. It was there, it was in existence, it was being properly conducted. Um, I, I just want to quote one other thing apropos of there not being any violation or any um, um, inappropriate behavior that, that um, would justify reviewing, revoking, modifying, or doing anything else with regard to um, this vested right, the use permit. And that is, I'm quoting from the November 26, 2014 Marin Independent Journal. Um, uh, Chief Morin, I noticed, was here earlier tonight. I'm gonna quote him. I wish he had stayed around so he could hear himself quoted. In that issue of the IJ, uh, this matter of, of Deer Park Villa was brought up and the noise issues and, and the chief explained, and I quote, now when a resident complains about noise at Deer Park, police ask the reporting party if he or she is willing to have an officer come to the resident's house to measure the decibel level. A measurement was taken in 23 cases and in none of those cases were the decibel levels in violation of the law. We have a valid use permit. It's a vested right. There have not been violations. There isn't a nuisance exception uh, that, that would be appropriate to this situation. Um, a, Attorney Colson and I discussed one ambiguity. I'll call it an ambiguity. And that is, does the um, use permit exist presently in exactly the same state that it was granted in 1976? And the answer is no. Um, well, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Typical lawyer, the answer is yes and, and no. Um, first of all, in 1978, the town council did a partial revocation of the use permit Taking away, taking away the entitlement to um, have amplified music on the outdoor premise, parts of the premises. That was the Giardelli's joint issue by uh, suing Fairfax in Marin County Superior Court. And essentially the Marin County Superior Court um, uh, revoked or rescinded that revocation of a portion of the, the um, uh, use permit. I hope 
that were not in Jirigandelli um, uh, versus Fairfax all over again. Um, the, 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 unfortunately, there are a lot of missing records here, but there's no question that there was a use permit. There's also really no question what went on in the Superior Court. Um, I have looked at, at minutes of the town council and uh, the late uh, attorney Myers, I believe his name was, who was then the town council, ex town attorney, explained to the town council that you can't do that and the court uh, uh, overruled and rescinded the revocation of the use permit because there was no public nuisance, there was no showing, there was no background uh, to, to any justification for revoking partially or fully. And, and bear in mind when, when you modify, in essence, that's a partial revocation uh, of the use permit and there are no grounds and there are no grounds now, I submit, uh, based on, on what I've said about compliance with both the noise ordinance and the use permit. There is one other issue, and, and um, Attorney Colson and I discussed it at some length, and that is, what's the story? Is it 8.30 or 10 o'clock that is the, that is the uh, cutoff time? Um, Mike Jerngelli um, believes that there was a later amendment to, to the use permit extending the time to 10 p.m. Um, it, it's unclear whether or not that is the case, as I think um, uh, uh, Mr. Toy pointed out. Um, it, it's been hard enough, to, not by me, but by others, to find the, uh, the original record of the use permit, to find the judgment of the Marin County Superior Court, and, and to uh, uh, bring out into the open all of the other details. In 1981, um, the noise ordinance was passed. And the noise ordinance, the passage of the noise ordinance and, and the Deer Park Villa uh, use permit are very closely, in fact, I would say directly related. The original use permit had that 830 provision in it that for events other than charitable events, the, the outdoor music had to stop at 830. It also had a provision in there, um, in an understandable one, that basically said if, the, if an officer on patrol thinks the music is too loud, he can uh, go on the premises and tell them to turn it down. It's slightly more artfully phrased, but basically that's it. Understandably, that was not a really good standard. And the noise ordinance was passed in direct response to that circumstance. Um, if, if, if it's helpful, I can uh, provide all of the minutes of the town council on the basis of which I'm saying all of these things. At that time, the point is that, that the noise ordinance, directly or indirectly, um, effectively put a gloss on, effectively um, amended, directly or indirectly, the use permit in the sense that instead of if the constable on patrol thinks it's too loud, he can make them turn it down, and instead uh, imposed limits based on decibels and uh, a number of other um, technical considerations. At the same time, it's our belief that the, that the use permit was effectively amended as well um, so that just as instead of does, does the policeman think it's too loud being the standard, instead of 8.30, 10 o'clock became the standard. There, is, there was a complete concurrence with this. You'll notice that... Um, excuse me. Okay. So we've gone on a little bit, and I think you're, you're raising a lot of issues, but we, we can't continue for another... I mean, okay. if you can wrap it up, please. I will wrap it up. I will wrap it up. Uh, um, by, by saying, first of all, um, that it's unclear as to whether the 8.30 or the 10 o'clock is the cutoff time. The other thing is, under the circumstances I've described, yes, there is one ambiguity that maybe needs to be resolved, but it's not an intentional or willful 
a violation of a condition of the ordinance. And for all of those reasons, and if you look at both the applicable state law and the relevant provision of the Code of Ordinances of Fairfax, there's no justification, no legal justification for referring this for consideration of revocation or modification of the use permit to the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I didn't think we had further speakers, but I think Rose wanted to speak. Thank you. You okay. can sit down. Mayor, actually, can I ask him one yeah, can we ask him some questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, you can uh, go first. Yeah. I, I have a quick question for you. Not a quick question for you, which is somewhere around the third sentence, on four, uh, I got unhappy because up until the second sentence, what I was hearing was we should be able to work this out. Um, and if we can't work it out, then unfortunately, I think we're all going to get to know each other a little bit better uh, than we really want to under these circumstances. What I heard you say in the first or second sentence was there must be an accommodation, if I understood correctly, there must be an accommodation here. And I think there is an accommodation here. I don't understand, and I've only been sitting here listening to this for tens of hours over the last two years, but I, I just can't figure out why Mike Gerangeli won't make the technological fixes, all of them, now that will alleviate this problem so that the folks in the neighborhood won't have to suffer this um, for more than another, I think Barbara said July 31st, for, for another uh, month and change. And it is incomprehensible to me that this has been going on this long. What I fear is that if we're not able to cut off this um, unfortunate bottleneck, what we're going to end up with, we're, we're going to go to litigation. And then all this stuff that you listened to hours ago about the trails and the 25,000 and 50,000 to do trails, we're going to give it to her uh, because we're going to have to go into litigation. And I think as an attorney, you would agree with me that, um, boy, wasting money on civil litigation is just about one of the dumbest things that we could do in a situation like this. So I'm really, really for the umpteenth time hoping your client, I see that he met with John, came up with some reasonable um, solutions. Numbers one through four, I heard. Maybe there's another couple uh, that are potentially there. Um, nice looking pamphlet that we got with some suggested ideas as well. Tell me why I should be wasting one more minute on this council listening to this craziness when he has the ability to simply make the technological fixes necessary to alleviate the problem so that I never have to hear or see the people on Porteous Avenue complaining ever again. First of all, I, um, I spend almost all of my time trying to keep my clients out of court for all the reasons you've alluded to. Secondly, I really mean it sincerely when I say, you know, from a personal standpoint, from my limited involvement with this, that I, I do hope that something gets worked out. Thirdly, however, I'm a lawyer, and as a lawyer, sometimes you have to be the skunk at the garden party. And I mean that only in the sense that I think there were some legal principles that were misstated or that were not stated, and it was my job just to say them. That said, I do agree with you that, it, that it's worth um, con uh, considering further and discussing further and exploring further whatever sound suppression measures might, uh, might take. Um, and I'm happy to turn it over to him and let him respond to that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you pretty okay. did. But you did a great job. Um, what I really want to hear from your client tonight is I will put in this stuff, these fixes, and I will do it by X date. Then this problem, theoretically, as far as I can tell, goes away because we would have a binding, in a, in a way, a, a agreement spoken over the transom here that the problem will be addressed and those people will be satisfied. I, I am not minimizing the fact that this would cost serious bucks. I certainly don't want to do that. On the other hand, nobody in this room, except for possibly Michael and you, um, wants Deer Park Villa to survive and prosper more than us because that whole conversation we had an hour ago about all those trails and all that money and all the things that all the good five liberals want to spend, well, if he goes poof, that's a fair chunk of change that disappears off the table. We don't want that. What we want him to do is say, I'm going to put in these technological fixes that I know will work and I will do it by X date. 
And yeah. I think I just want to add one thing is I came in here thinking that that was going to be something that Mike was going to say July 1. Now, I understand it's a lot of money, but when I hear maybe the next couple of months or next few months, um, you know, we're, we're not anywhere close. So I think Peter had a question. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. O'Connell, something. Uh, it, you were, it sounded like you were quoting from a use permit. You said it was dated May 24th, 1976. Uh, right. Do you, do you have a copy of that? Sure. Uh, I, I would love to see that. I, I haven't, I'm kind of new to this. It's actually a copy of the minutes. Oh, copy you, of the you, minutes, yeah. Right, which we can give you. We have all that. I mean, he got it. I'm okay, I, it sounded like you said you had the actual use permit. You were no, no. It, 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 I have I have the minutes, and the minutes recite exactly what was passed as the use permit. But I don't have okay. a piece of paper that at the top of it says permit. I have the, the minutes showing what was passed. Okay, yeah. Uh, do we have a Janet comment? has a comment. Excuse me. I think in our conversations, we've clarified that they don't have anything more than what we have. We, we all have the same material. I, I think one of the things that would have been helpful for our packet is to have that piece of the minutes. Yeah, I, I haven't seen those those minutes that he's referring to. So, I, I'd like to quickly respond to a couple of points that the mayor made and David made. Um, one is uh, for probably since the day I arrived at Deer Park, we've been doing nothing but making improvements and been totally engaged with the neighborhood in mitigation. All kinds of things we have done, okay? Uh, this latest step that we're talking about um, is relatively new. It came out of the mediation. It was about that sound system you're looking at, a few other ideas by the sound engineer. Um, and also uh, the idea that uh, John Reed uh, uh, suggested. So those are all moving forward. I, there's no doubt about it. Just my quick perspective is is that, like I said, for three years I've done nothing but go into Deer Park and, and make improvements, including working with the neighbors, including stopping certain portions of our music program and things like that. So including the one violation in 35 years. So I do feel like we're, we're trying hard, David. Um, you know, when you're spending another, you know, 25 for the music system and who knows how much that wall is going to cost, you know, plus all the other things we've actually done at Deer Park, um, it does add up. But that's not an excuse. If it's a mayor, if it's your desire that we act quicker on that music system, that would certainly be something we would do. Um, you see the, the bid there, and uh, um, that's something that we can do quicker. But uh, um, there has been a lot of uh, financial pressure, so to speak, that we've been faced with. So not a complaint, just a challenge, you might say. So, um, and, and by the way, you know, if you weren't represented by an attorney, I wouldn't be represented by an attorney. I'm just trying to level the playing field a little bit and bring in a little perspective. I will say one last thing, and that is, I know for a fact that I have seen in the past the permit upgraded with a reflection of the 1981 ordinance, which is why my family took that permit and that ordinance and put it into our policies for the past 35 years. So just like we couldn't find the original permit and then we couldn't find the fact out that you know no one believed me or my family that we went to court and then after that, we got another permit that was upgraded. This 1981 ordinance is part of our permit. That's all, I, that's all I have to say. It's just common sense. And I saw it with my own eyes, but it was years ago. And uh, hanging on the wall in our, in our handbook at Deer Park. And that's my, like I've been right pretty much all along in that part. So I promised that we could, uh, I'm not sure we'll talk to Garrett maybe tomorrow. I'll set up a quicker timeline on the music system, which is the surround sound. Um, and after that, you know, our record, I think, speaks for itself. We have a great record. And we'll continue to mitigate, and we'll continue to have a great record, and be good citizens and good neighbors. 
So I would appreciate if everything just stayed the same because uh, that I know how to work with. Thank you. Um, can I? Thank you. Uh, let's let Rose speak. She's been waiting patiently for many hours like several other people. Hi, Rose. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, Rose, could you say your name and address oh, okay. again? Okay, Rose Tabor, and I live at 94 Hillside Drive. And I have been working on this problem. We bought our house in 1965. And I've worked with Mike's parents, his sister, and now we've tried mediation with Mike. And it's the problem has gotten consistently worse. When Bob was there, we could work with him, call him up, and we had words, but we got it straightened out. When Wendy was there, we could call up and say, Wendy, help us here. And she would make sure that the noise was turned down. The last two, two three years, it's been horrendous. We cannot sit on our deck, and we're clear up on Hillside. So you're, we're about 10 blocks away from the restaurant, and we cannot sit out there at 6, 7 o'clock when we have dinner and visit because the music is so loud. We don't want to put Mike out of business. That is not. But with the equipment that's available now, I think that we can, our rights can be respected also. It's, it can't be all the bloody dollar. It has to be some of our private rights to be able to enjoy our properties. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you, Rose. Uh, Renee, did you have a question? Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to speak for one moment here. Okay. Um, so, so here, so there's a use permit that doesn't exist, um, except for what's in the minutes here. And then there's that there's been a change to the use permit and it's been, the time has been extended, but we don't have a copy of that and they don't exist. Um, the logical thing to do when we're dealing with use permits is go to the Planning Commission and have it discussed and decide how, how we should work with this use permit, whether it exists or not. In the meantime, I'm hearing great ideas about things that you can do to um, suppress the sound, to mitigate the sound. I, Mike, I completely appreciate that you have been willing to look at this and the different things you've tried over the last two years since I've been sitting here and doing this. Um, and I'm totally willing to give you the opportunity to make, make good on those things and see if they can work. I've also been listening to the neighbors, and at this point, they have been so patient that I'm embarrassed sitting up here. Um, they have respectfully submitted petitions. They have, they, have, they have spoken. They have gone to mediation with you. They have shown up. They've been continued on meetings. And um, what I'm hearing is that we are going to go on as if this use permit exists. So in the use permit, it says 8.30 for non-charitable events and 10 o'clock for charitable events. So as we're sorting all this out and as we take it to Planning Commission, which is what I would like to recommend we do because they are the ones that deal with permits. This isn't passing the buck. That's what they do. I'm trying to understand why it is that we don't enforce what is on the said permit um, and explore all these positive ways of making the problem better. So I can't see doing this one without the other. Um, and we have to continue to discuss the enforcement issue. Um, I think right now there is something that's been said, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say this, is that, is that while an ordinance is being revised or re-looked at and before it's approved, then that ordinance as was written originally is the ordinance that is that prevails. Um, these are things we have to look at. But in the meantime, I'm hearing stories about neighbors' windows that rattle and needing to buy air conditioning because windows can't be opened. And a lot of the trouble is in the hills. So we've got a problem that we need to fix. And what I would say is that thank you so much for going for these measures that are going to make it better. I'm hoping they'll make it better. But in the meantime, we need to to create some peace in the neighborhood. And if we're gonna live by the use permit as if the use permit exists, then we should use, we should live by what the use permit says. Can I respond to that? Sure. Maybe quickly, because I think we're really back here, but go ahead. But one, 
what's wrong with your analysis is that number one, there's been one violation in 34 years. So the way you measure whether it's a nuisance or not doesn't exist, number one, okay? The, it, there's been no vi the one violation in 34 years. Um, so there's not any windows rattling and that kind of thing. And, and secondly, um, uh, the 1981 ordinance is what re our use permit reflects. Not the one you're looking at in 1978, the updated one that was codified in 1981. That's the use permit. Okay, so Mike, And that's thank the you. one I've seen and that's the one we've been doing. And by the way, that's the way you've been enforcing it for 35 years. I think, um, bringing it back here, a couple of things. We don't agree that public nuisance is a standard and also what we know from the minutes is that there was a 76 use permit. We have no other information regarding what you saw in Deer Park Villa at one point. So Janet, did, is there any comments you'd like to make or shall we make a motion to move forward? I don't have any comments. Okay, so I think Renee started to make a motion. I think a couple of things, Renee, that I would add is that I think you brought up the point of bringing this to the Planning Commission so they can further ratify the use permit um, back from 76 and look at some of these other issues. Um, but as far as enforcing something, you know, that we just have minutes on, I think that's fairly difficult. And, um, but I think Mike appears willing to move forward on this sound system much more quickly. Um, and I think we should send it back to the Planning Commission so we can ratify this use permit and then we really um, can look at some of these issues. Uh, John, you had something? Yeah, I mean, I, before we go down the rosy path, I mean, I, I think you've talked about putting this sound system in by a date, right? I mean, I, I, I think that that's really what we did you want to right. yeah I mean let's figure out what the date is and agree to that um, you know and I and I see that this talks about the sound system I mean that your sound guy was talking about um, I mean I see dance floor illustrated here I mean is he talking about putting some kind of pat are you talking about putting it's some kind of pad Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Not we the need big the speakers that are just kind of trying to take care of everything. It's, you know, yes. surround sound in the forest, so it's right there where the people are sitting. Yeah, and it's turned it's, down. It's more zoned. Yeah, you might say. It's designed to. Mm -hmm. And this is the breakout. Mitigate any noise. Yeah. So basically, did you just when you went through this with bananas at large? Did you go through with them what the problem was and is this system designed to address this specific right. problem? Yeah, they had just put a system in like this at the Bohemian Club, up wherever that is, you know, Guerneville or whatever that is. And uh, they had a similar issue with the neighbors um, who were asking for, is there a way that this can be handled better? And uh, so hence came something like that. And so that's what he was basing his idea on um, just like when we met with the sound en engineer, he asked me how many times have you guys been over the limit? I said, well, once, but that's not the point. We still want to mitigate it, which has been my attitude the whole time. Okay. But the truth of the matter is it has been once in 35 years. Okay. And Let me ask true. you just on the technical side of this stuff. Is this sort of, hopefully you wouldn't go out and just buy the stuff and then you're, you, you've got it. I would hope that they would bring equipment in and swap different things in and out to to sort of test this thing. I, you know, when you buy, I don't know how they would do it. I, to me, I think you might have to buy it to find out. But they, they you know, it's just a system that is, is instead of two big speakers that go like that, it's speakers that are going like this all around. 
in, you know, so if, if we're barely getting over, you know, if we're barely hitting 55 now, maybe it will make it 53 or 52 or whatever. And then when we build that wall eventually, which I do need to wait till January to do that, um, I think that's going to be almost like having a castle, for God's sakes. You know, it's really going to block the view of the road where the cars drive by. So it's going to give the, not only will it help with the, any sound, but it will help with uh, aesthetics, I believe, because it's going to enclose that grove, and people will have a sense, of, they'll have a more sense of privacy as well, as opposed to seeing my aunt's house or the family's homes. So, um, yeah, I think these are good improvements. You know, and, and I think that's, you know, um, I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I. I'm glad you agree that, that I, I think that the sound wall is going to enhance things. I mean, what concerns me, I mean, in, in the um, in the multi-point plan that you're, has your sound guy seen this? Well, he recommended that. Yeah. I can call him up and show him, but, you yeah. know, Bananas at Large, by the way, was brought up in our, one of the few things that were brought up, or not the few things, but brought up at mediation. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I called Bananas at Large was that I heard that name as maybe somebody that could do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I yeah, still need it, to... And it looks yeah. like a system that can do this sort of thing. I mean, what concerns me is it, basically this is all about what Bananas is going to sell you, right? And I guess what concerns me is... Well, I can get other is, bids. But. Yeah, well, yeah, or, you know, get other bids, but that's basically just about the sound system. I would like... I mean, that, that sound guy had, you know, I guess four points in the email that you forwarded to me, you know, about different aspects, you know, like the, the curtain to block, you know, right. the, that thing. And, and then the, uh, I've been trying con to locate. the concrete that was reflecting sound right. towards the hills and putting some sort of padded surface on that so that sure. that didn't happen. Well, I, um, yeah. And these are all short, you know, things that don't take a whole construction thing to do I sure mean, basically it's buying the stuff and putting it in obviously that takes what well, we're even adding days and not months we're, so it's it's within reach now right and and i would like more than just buying the sound system but putting it in in a way and working with your sound guy so that it's effective well, of course there's a lot of design in that so there is yeah yeah, I mean, I, there was I'm, I'm pretty doubting, well thought I'm out. I'm not doubting that at all, but I, I would like to have your sound guy involved and having more than just the sound system, having, you know, covering I, I up need the to, reflecting surface first. I want to point instance. something out to the council because I want to tell you how obvious it was. We've had the permit to do this <laughs> since 1981, the way it's written, is that the only issue at Deer Park has been, is the decibel level too high? It's never been, hey, it's 9.30 at night, you're over... It's you're supposed to be done by 8:30. That was resolved in 1981, and that's why since then, for 34 years, they've been enforcing both the time and the decibels. And when it hits 10 o'clock, you're not supposed to do it. We yeah. volunteer. Okay, so I just want you to know that yeah. that's and you know I, it's, and it's. I understand it's, why you're it's saying your that own enforcement. Now, but yeah, I mean that conversation is getting into a much longer legal okay. conversation. No, no, this is the solution. And the That's conversation fine. that I'd like to be in is like, how do we fix the problem of the noise being, I mean, because, you know, it's loud at three in the afternoon too, you know, and, and why not do something to mitigate that so that it still, you know, makes a nice atmosphere for your business, but at the same time makes it so the neighbors aren't. It will make it better. It's, yeah. And that's and our and, and, intention. And that's where I would like to get. And, Buying the sound system is one thing, but I think it's really important to work with your sound guy and do the other mitigation measures that are within reach sure. within this time schedule. Um, By the way, indoors... As a part of that first John, stage. John, yes. indoors we um, are getting bids on putting, putting drapes or curtains, or not curtains, but drapes, and cover the windows so when the music's indoors, it will be more less likely to go outside yeah and that that's all you know it's all part of the so cost i mean doing no business. we're not stopping but, with just this if yeah. that's what you're asking well oh, uh, i mean inside is an, it's another different subject and you know i'm no i'm just I saying think what we're talking about the, the problem with the sound is on the outside right now right and 
you know, and yes, it costs 23000 for this sound system. Um, you know, it probably costs something to cover that cement pad, too. Probably not that much, you know. It's a, I'm thinking yeah, it's I don't some know. kind of padded carpet thing. So right. can um, we maybe... But that's a cost of doing business. And, you know, as a businessman, you have to figure that into your calculations. But that enables you to go forward without having the neighbors coming out with pitchforks, which they, uh, you know, frankly, they're going to do. And if it gets to the point where, you know, like colleagues here are saying, well, let's go to the planning commission, then it turns into a legal battle, but they'll be showing up with pitchforks at the legal battle and that's not going to yeah, help I've been your situation. Those pitchforks, don't worry. So, uh, well, um, you know, I mean, I think we need to, we don't need to go there. I mean, I don't want to go let's there. Let's fix the problem. Let's I, fix the problem. I think there's a couple of things. I think there's two things on the table, which is mitigation measures, which John's adding that you should talk to your sound engineer about adding more than a sound system, maybe covering the cement and some other issues that John brought up. But I don't think some of us on the council are saying no to the planning commission. I think we need to ratify that use permit and move forward on that as well as starting these mitigation measures. And when do you feel that you can actually get those in place? We're at June 3rd now. Well, I gotta, I gotta, I'd have to talk to Bananas at large, but sure. I told you by some, I imagine it'd take at least till uh, sometime in July. So early July? I think so. Okay. But yeah. I know one thing, going to the planning commission and then me spending umpteen thousand dollars on something when we already have the permit since 1981 to do this doesn't make any okay, sense Mike, to me. Okay, uh, Mike, the only thing we have on the record is minutes that talk about a use permit in 1976. So that's what we have. That's not true, by the way. That's what we have in the minutes, and you're saying, so... Let's agree to disagree, but it's not. But there's minutes the minute, from 1978 that you have. Wait, wait, wait. Can I make a suggestion here? I mean, yes. wait, go wait, ahead, Mike, David. Wait, just go ahead, Dad. Um, you don't my, have the information. Uh, it's my understanding that the Planning Commission couldn't possibly hear this until its July meeting. So between now and then, we have a council meeting coming up on July 15th. You could come back here and report to us on progress that you've made. Assuming that all of the agreed upon or completion completion are made by that date, I don't see why the planning commission would have to hear it and take it up on that date. So, uh, so you would be getting a nice grace period here in which to show and demonstrate that you can put these items in. Of course, bananas at law shows up and says we can't do it until August third. David, with all due respect. I this feels a lot like where we were a year ago with the sound wall and the um, the living sound wall. And please, I'm not belittling the efforts. I'm really not. And I came out there and saw them. But it didn't fix the problem. And if we're going to... we do, No, but one second. We do keep kicking it down the we're road. We're not kicking and, it down the road. What we're saying to but Mike... But we won't know no, if no, it no, works listen, in a listen month, to me. David. Listen to me. We, the Planning Commission cannot possibly get this on an agenda until July. It can't do it in June, obviously. It's down the okay, road. Okay, so wait, so, I, I hear what you're saying, but then we need to have Why the... don't we let David finish his thoughts so first? So let's, let's, let's give Mike the opportunity to show in good faith after his meeting with John that we asked for that he will put into place these four or five things that were, I think, agreed upon, if not then, then certainly right now. And if that can be done, then there's no reason for the Planning Commission to take this up. I am mindful of the fact that you're dealing with a third party who might not be able to you know, perform within the tight time frame. But you could come to us and say, I have purchased X, Y, and Z. It will be installed on Y. And at that point, we can see the good faith that's going in here, and we can not move forward on the Planning Commission okay. route. If, if we don't see that, we could, at our July meeting, send it down the route of the, of the Planning Commission. And we don't, we would prefer not to do that. It's a waste of your time, your money, your aggravation, town staff, the whole thing. Um, and I believe that you truly do want to do everything you've said so, here today and to do the right thing. So, so, if so you're right. Let's let Renee, I do. Let's let Renee so, step so in. If there's a chance that we're going to do that and wait the month and then come back and check it out and see what's happened, 
then I really think it's important that we keep the terms of the supposed use permit in place and that we see those times as... Well, the reason why we can't do that well, is I, we have agreements with our customers based on the 1981 ordinance, which is what our permit says today. Well, we have to look at the daytime hours on the, on the ordinance as well, which we talked about a year ago. I, I just don't want to wait a month and say, I, we, without having any recourse for these neighbors in terms of making their lives and better this summer. And I hear what you summer. said. And I got to tell you, I think that we are holding the sort of Damocles over Mike's head in this conversation. I think John had a good breakthrough here. And I th I'm hearing, in good faith, I, I know you're not going to show me up to be a naive and a fool. Uh, and that when we come back here in July, there's going to be firm commitments, either completed work or contracts, bills of but, sale. But this is not doubting what it is that you're intending to do and that I hope will happen. This is saying where are the protections in the meantime if we're living under the guise or the truth that we have, a, that there is a use well, permit, but, even but, to the point where we wouldn't even okay. ask you to go to planning commission. But, but, but here's the problem with that, is that we, we sold the events under the 1981 law, which is what our permit reflects, and which you've been enforcing for 35 years. Logic tells me and should tell you that we have the permit to do it. And that's the truth. Just because you can't find it doesn't mean we don't have it, as I've proved three times so far already. But to David's point, we will continue to mitigate. You've got something in front of you there, which was born out of a <coughs> process. And um, we'll continue to work on it and seriously work on it. I think it's, I think it's not a continuing to work on right. it. If, if I, I don't know where the I don't know where the done. council's going on this, but well, I do feel that, that I'd like you to come in here July fifteenth and say everything's in place. I don't want to say in July fifteenth, oh, uh, we don't have the money for this, or oh, you know somebody isn't feeling well, so we can't do this. I'm not feeling very comfortable about not going to the Planning Commission, but I will say that um, if the sound system were in place and if some of the other measures that John talked to you about could be in place, or at least a bill of sale showing that it would be installed on X date, then I think we would feel more comfortable that there were even more efforts to make this right. That's agreeable. Okay. If I may. Um, uh, yes, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't see any reason not to uh, send this to the Planning Commission to ratify the conditions. Um, there's an ambiguity about what the uh, use permit is. Um, and these actions are not inconsistent. In fact, they're consistent. Getting a, a sound system in place to mitigate the noise um, issues uh, would go a long way to satisfying. Um, the purpose of going to the Planning Commission is to, first of all, ratify the conditions. And then if there are issues in the future, then the Planning Commission is empowered to look at the use permit. Um, and I think it's necessary to take those steps uh, to make sure that the use permit is being enforced because we have a lot of uh, complaints from the neighbors that, um, that it's not. And I, you know, I'm glad that you're finally investing in these, this upgraded sound system. Uh, it's a good investment for your business. Uh, it'll make for uh, better events for your business. Um, and it should go a long way towards alleviating uh, the sound leaching out into the neighborhood, which will also go a long way towards um, making sure that uh, you're operating within the uh, parameters of the use permit, which would be consistent with the Planning Commission also uh, ratifying and looking at the use permit. Um, and 
I think it's necessary to. I, I got to say one thing. What, uh, everything comes down to economics. If this was a fly-by-night company, somebody that just blew into town and just you know took us over the coals, I'd be, I'd be right there with you. Family's been here since a long time. If we begin to go right now, I have heard a former council member of this town, I think you were born in this town, and has, his family has run a business since Roosevelt was in the White House. I'm going to believe that he's going, I'm going to take him on his word that he's going to do it. Because what I don't want him to do is turn to the white haired guy um, just behind him and start cutting him checks left and right. I do not want to start turning to the uh, town attorney and start um, improving upon her $140,000 uh, budget item that we have here and start us down the process of, of chaos. I just don't want to do it. And I might add that if the Porteous neighbors have read the tea leaves here, they might also be thinking about the need to start lawyering up in this process also. So what I see here is the ultimate chaos. And I see our role is trying to thread the needle to get around that. What I liked about what John did is that he's, he's come up with a platform of ideas. What I'm hearing from the former council member is that he's going to do everything possible by July 15th to implement or sh demonstrate through a bill of sale that he's purchased the widgets to do what he says he will do and hopefully not make a liar and a fool out of me. Um, if that should not happen, then let the furies of stupidity reign and we can go to the Planning Commission and let them do their worst and certainly it will come back to us and everybody will be paying lawyers left and right to resolve this problem. Before we jump on that ship, I want to give Mike a last breath. I want to throw him the rope because I know he's going to do the right thing or otherwise I'm sort of done with you. So this is it. I yeah. think one for a thing guy I, that's never broken the law, I appreciate that. One, one thing I will say before we go on, just, um, you know, somebody said something last time, I think it was me saying, we need to wrap this up. And I think Bob wrote me a note or brought, said, wait a minute, we've been working on this a long time, let's do it right. So even though I'm concerned that we're not dealing with all the issues like ratifying the permit and I know there's been some discussion of changing the times in that zone on the um, on the code I do think that I'm in agreement with David and I think John's kind of nodding his head that um, it's you know let's let's try this and I have a firm belief that Mike is a man of his word, and he's going to come in here and show us all that, you know, we will do these mitigations and ASAP and really try to make things better for people that live around there and live in the hills where the sound tends to go. And as much as I would like to get everything wrapped up in a nice bow tonight, I don't think we're going to be there. So, um, and I'm really thinking about what you said to me last time, Bob, although you're probably thinking, why did I say that? But it does seem to me like we should really, John made, made big inroads here, and let's see if July 15th we really have that commitment coming forward. And I'm hoping for more than bills of sale. I'd like to see it done. And then, you know, we all go to Deer Park Villa and everybody feels pretty good about it. I'm sure that there will still be some sound, but I think to the extent that we can mitigate a lot of it through these measures, um, people will be much more happy having Deer Park Villa, you know, in their midst who haven't been so happy right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I just need to understand, maybe you guys could explain to me then, okay, so July 15th comes and we see either a bill of sale or we see that it's been purchased. And no. We see a lot. Yeah, I think, yeah, on I, July I, 15th I just, we see I'm, I'm it's just, done uh, and we've got that That's great and it's been tested and done. that... Well... I'm just wanting to look at the timeline. Yeah. I want these neighbors to know, you know, they said, we, let's not rush because we don't want to do it wrong. Mm -hmm. We've gone this far, let's mm -hmm. make it right. What happens from July 15th? Because 
this just feels too yeah, ethereal I mean, I, to me. I, I think, yeah, it, it, it's an inexact science. Nobody's saying, okay, you put this sound system in and it's going to be X number of decibels because, you know, there's a volume control on that amp that I saw. You know, I mean, <clears throat> there's a question of how it's used and how it's installed, you know. The DJ, I mean, obviously you have that, that's a daily thing dealing with different DJs coming in saying, oh, you know, you got to keep it down this kind of level. Excuse me, John. I think Renee's going to something a little more than the, than the details of that. I think what okay. you're trying to get is. I guess the point I'm saying, yeah, the immediate stuff is done and then we'll be able to see those results. I mean, a meter will tell you how many decibels it is. We don't know what that is going in, but we know it's going to be less. And then we don't know how the sound wall is going to change it, but it's going to be less. And we're right, I am John. I appreciate the spirit in which you're looking at this. Yeah. I really do, and mm -hmm. it's hard for me to believe that this is even me pushing this way. But I, but I really think that if I were a member of the public right now, I'd say, but wait a minute, you guys have codes for this, and wait a minute, the, the, the hours are absurd. That 10 o'clock is the end of a daytime. Um, there's things we can do, and I feel as though we've done this conversation. I don't want it to end. I, I don't know why we're seeing the Planning Commission as like we've, we've gone down the road to hell. That's not what I see the Planning Commission as. I think that they are smart minds who we appoint who can then look at this from a permitting point of view. Um, and I think that your ideas and what you've done and the inroads are awesome and really need to be explored for an ultimate solution. But they are not everything. And I, I really feel like leaving here wondering what's going to come on July 15th is not fair at this point after two years of sitting here and doing this. I, so I, what do we do true, next? I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> it is a permitting issue. It's not the road to hell and litigation. It's a permitting issue where uh, it's based on what is actually happening um, in the neighborhood at the facility. If there's complaints, then uh, the, to warrant looking at the use permit, uh, just like with the Good Earth, uh, then that's something that the Planning Commission can look at. And there's sufficient uh, complaints by the neighbor that this is an ongoing problem. Now, installing a more focused uh, sound system may alleviate the problem. That would be great. Uh, putting up the sound walls, that would be great too. But uh, we do need to... Um, uh, it, it is an issue that's been ongoing, um, and it's it's the other issue that uh, Mike raised. Um, you know, you can be a nuisance without breaking the law. You, you can be a nuisance without there being a measurable decibel level because it's hard to get out there and measure the decibel levels under the noise ordinance. Um, so that doesn't, you know, mean that there's a clean bill of health. It's an ongoing issue. It's a matter of finding the balance. And the Planning Commission is empowered to do that. And we should be looking at making sure that this use permit is operating as it should. And the, if it's consistently loud enough where it's causing problems, then maybe it's not operating as it should. And moving forward with making these investments is great. And that will go a long way towards hopefully making it a moot point before the Planning Commission. But I think we do need to uh, take that step. Um, perhaps we could put it off for a month or two but I, I don't want to put it off beyond that. Perhaps we could continue this uh, for a month or two, but I, I don't want to just leave it hanging out there, leave it vague and like, oh, you know, throw our hands up and go, well, uh, he's going to put up a sound system. He's going to put up, or put up a sound wall, put up a sound system. So, you know, we have come to a place where I think we do need to um, bring it to the Planning Commission. I'd be willing to delay it for a month or two, um, see what the effects are of the sound system. Maybe that will go a long way towards alleviating uh, the complaints. It's good business to do that, um, but I, you know, 
we as, as a planning or as a uh, town council um, need to address this and we can't have it be continue to be open-ended so why don't we do a couple things um, it's getting really late is that I would say this is July 15th we're not gonna have a lot of stuff on the agenda because a lot of it's the budget so the issue is going to be specific to Deer Park Villa as far as the sound measures. And then for the August meeting, we can uh, take up the issue again of the uh, planning commission, which is not the road to hell. I sat on that for a couple of years and Peter was on it for eight. So we know <laughs> David was on it as well. Maybe when David was on it, it was the road to hell. Um, okay, then it was then. Um, just kidding. But um, let's take that up in August, the issue of the Planning Commission and potentially changing the, the noise limits um, within that table and maybe some other issues on the noise ordinance. So we can split this. So I think I have, someone needs to make a motion. I, I need I to would. ask one more question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Janet, why is it that we are operating under the assumption that there is a use permit until we look at it through the Planning Commission, but we are not enforcing or not able to enforce like is written in the assumed use permit? I just want to understand because it doesn't make sense to me. I recommend that we... Um go before the Planning Commission and actually reaffirm, ratify, whatever term you want to use, the, uh, what we believe the conditions are on the existing use permit before we try to enforce them. Can I say something? I'm just having a hard time being quiet. Um, if, you, if you do, you have to come up to the podium. Laws are on the books for businesses and they're also on the books for residents. And what we're basically doing is coming up with a situation where we say, well, we don't know whether this is on the books or not, so we're not going to enforce it. Either it is or it isn't. If it doesn't work, then you have to enforce the, the zoning ordinance, which is much, much stricter. It means that Mike can't have any outdoor activity. He can't have any music whatsoever. Is that what you want to enforce? Either one is valid or the other one is valid. I think it's ridiculous to say that, no, I'm sorry, there's nothing. We're going to try to figure out whether or not we can enforce it. I think, I think that there's a difference, Bob, and that is um, maybe Janet wants to add something, yeah, is that, that? The, the fact that we have a record that there was a use permit would mean that you, um, even though there's ambiguity about that use permit, you cannot then say that the zoning prevails because there is the concept that we do have a use permit, so the zoning cannot trump that. That's why you can't Fine, do that. Fine, let's enforce it then. What, what I'm asking for basically is we've gone through an entire summer, the summer of 2014, with noise levels higher than ever before. So for all the effort we put into it, we actually had a worse situation. Why? Because the, the uh, correction for character of sound suddenly was not enforced. And so we're asking, could we have some relief? Are we really going to go all the way until August, where almost all of the events are going to take place d during summer, where there's no relief whatsoever, where nothing is being enforced? Neither the, 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 the noise ordinance nor the use permit, nothing is being enforced and the neighbors are being screwed. That's what happened in 2014. I really don't want you guys to finish this meeting. I know it's 11.30 without giving us any type of relief. Okay, you know, um, I, I think, I, I, Thank Jan, you, I agree with Janet. Uh, I, th I think it does make sense to go forward, have the Planning Commission ratify this so that we have an enforceable use permit on the books by which we can then in the future gauge things. We're not, Doing that isn't meaning that we're going to, you know, revoke it or threaten to revoke it. Um, but it's a first step towards having an enforceable use permit in place. Right now we're in this limbo where we can't take action on it. Let's ask you a quick question. Do we really have the authority, Janet, do we really have the authority to turn to the Planning Commission and say, I want you to hear this, and in fact, we're going to tell you exactly 
what to say no the idea is that you would send it to the you to the planning commission for hearing the way that we get into a hearing before the planning commission is on verified allegations of a violation of what we believe the conditions are and the first step the planning commission would do is to ratify what we believe the conditions are based upon the minutes and then they would have the authority and the ability to look at whether or not those conditions are sufficient or adequate to meet the current situation have there been violations if so perhaps there needs to be some modification and there is your chaos which we want to hold off for a month or two while Mike goes forward with his good faith efforts because if he proves me a fool and a liar then let the planning commission go forward in all of its power it's not just you that would be a fool and a liar I think you would be a fool not to make it right with the neighbors because it's to, to get into a, a back and forth slug fest I mean basically if I was a business owner owning your business I would want to put in the best possible quietest sound system that I could that made my guests enjoy themselves and kept the neighbors happy because that would be the best possible situation then I could look forward to next year after I build the sound wall and make the environment even better in that thing being able to rent it out three times as many times because that's the key to a successful business yes there's cost to doing business but you can show your neighbors and this council you're going forward in a positive way and you know taking the bull by the horns and saying calling up bananas in the morning and saying yeah I'm gonna go ahead with this and furthermore I'm gonna have my sound guy meet with you and make sure it's what's gonna make my restaurant or my venue not bug the neighbors and be a good quality sound and you know move forward on the sound wall and yeah it's gonna cost some money but it's the cost of doing business and doing a good business you know and at that point if the neighbors are happy with the movements you're making towards having a positive good neighbor business I think this planning commission problem goes away too because I, you know I, then I, there I, aren't people complaining I don't think the planning commission is is a problem but what I would say is I'd like to have a motion and one of the uh, I think our chief is enforcing the noise ordinance we realize it's not a perfect Thing, but if we were to revise the noise ordinance uh, that would be many months so more um, requests to the chief to continue to doing what to, to respond to complaints um, in the meantime um, okay Bob we do not we do not discuss enforcement here we cannot order the police to do any specific type of enforcement that's not the council's responsibility and so we have asked for them to continue to enforce to the extent feasible that they can given the noise ordinance we're not going to have further discussion on this and I would like to have a motion so we can move this forward and David did you want to make the motion well, I'll try um, we will continue the item in until the July 15th meeting at which time we will review the actions by Deer Park Villa to go forward with the new sound system and the other suite of ideas that were discussed in your meeting you with know, your sound guy. with your sound guy the meeting that you held a week or so ago with uh, with John Reed okay and that in the event that the council is not provided with either completed actions or evidence that uh, the improvements are going to be made by dates certain the council will, will at that time take up the discussion of uh, referring the matter to the Planning Commission please don't make that happen that's my motion anyone want a second 
Anyone Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of... Just, we just want a second. Okay, there's other issues with the, I think adding to the moving to the planning commission, we should look at this noise, noise ordinance, ordinance in greater detail also, and I will second it with that. Okay, with that friendly amendment, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm, I'm voting no. Okay. And I'm voting no as well. Okay, so uh, Winesoft motion, friendly amendment, second. Read. Kohler, I and two no's. Okay, thank you all. Moving on to item 26. Let's do a, a very short staff report, Garrett. Item 26 is this. That's the second reading of the um, ordinance to the town council to amend the town code chapter related to clean indoor air and health protection, and it's including restrictions on the usage of electronic smoking devices and prohibit smoking, such smoking in tobacco retail stores. You actually introduced this ordinance on your May meeting, and tonight really is just a second reading and after the second reading it would take effect 30 days later but in essence it makes e-cigarettes uh, or similar devices illegal the same way tobacco would be treated thank you if there are no questions of staff I want to open it to public comment oh my gosh you've been waiting here for so many hours <laughs> I'm sorry uh, Mark Bell Public comment. 63 Domingo, you don't remember? <laughs> I think I could probably say your name and everyone's address by now. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know there were, even was this. I didn't even see here the first reading. I was in Moscow. Um, electronic smoking devices, do you mean vaporizing? Well, vapor vaporizers are not smoking devices. Mark, we had a presentation by the County Public Health mm -hmm. on this, and actually some of the representatives are here, and we have looked at this issue pretty extensively, so we're not going to answer questions on it. You can just make your comments. Okay, and well, I have no idea what the, any of the background on this. I just like saw this on the agenda. So, and prohibit smoking in tobacco retail smalls, uh, retail stores. Where is that permitted anyway? Um, actually, in the previous ordinance, it was allowed, even though we didn't have tobacco retail stores. Uh huh. So, no longer continued, even though we have no tobacco retail stores. Well, if I had known this was here and that this was going on, I would probably go find, have found something, but uh, vaporize, vaporizing is not smoking. It's, they're two totally different things. And um, where is it being restricted? It's, what, what's happening is the e-cigarettes are being included anywhere that smoking is banned or restricted. So it's just, it's just adding them to the smoking ordinance in the same places that cigarettes are limited, cigarette smoking. Well, I'd like to have seen this report saying that vaporized, uh, that vapors uh, from electronic devices are the same as smoke because it's a totally different process. It would be good if you had been here and perhaps you may want to look online at uh, the previous presentation we had on this and the discussion on the health effects and the problems with these devices. And that's going to be on what the minutes from the last meeting? You, um, you, yeah, or you can look at it online. Um, you know, you can look at the council meeting online. Oh, okay. Under the town council archives, you can watch the video or listen to the And audience. that's from last month's? Yes. May 6th. Okay, and so then um, if I have objections, since this is a second reading, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, well, you can raise your objections, but we're not going to be responding to them because some of these questions were asked at the last meeting. Asked and responded to. Yeah, okay. and covered. 
by our public health folks from the county. Mm -hmm. And so why don't they spend their time figuring out that sulfuric acid coming out of the exhaust of catalytic converters is much worse. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, any other comments um, with that? I'll bring it back to the council and thank you folks for sitting there for so long. Uh, so would someone like to make a motion? Yes, I will move to waive second reading and read uh, by title only and adopt ordinance 790, uh, ordinance of uh, Fairfax, amending town code title eight uh, to include restrictions on the usage of electronic smoking devices and prohibiting smoking in tobacco retail stores. Uh, second? All, all second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, passes. Okay, now we're moving on to item 27. Uh, Garrett, would you like to do another very, sh and thank you very much for coming from the county. I kept thinking you both looked familiar. <laughs> thank you. So uh, item 27 is the second reading of an ordinance to update the urban runoff pollution prevention regulations for the town. May 6, you actually introduced the first reading at that time. And in order for the town to be compliance with the phase two stormwater permit requirements, uh, this amendment must be adopted by the end of June. Okay, uh, is there any public comment on this matter? Uh, well, I'm not gonna ask if, uh, we'll bring it back to the council. Anybody I'll, have any questions? I'll make a motion to waive the second reading, read by title only and adopt ordinance 791, an ordinance of our town amending the municipal code 8.32 to update the urban runoff pollution prevention regs. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay. Uh, item 28, Garrett, would you like to do another very quick staff report? <laughs> sure. Item 28 is the second reading of an ordinance that allows overnight parking in the downtown area. Uh, you discussed and introduced the ordinance at your May meeting. Uh, if you basically this ordinance just gives the council flexibility to allow overnight parking in certain areas of downtown, which the second item right after this addresses. Okay, and is there any public comment on this matter? Um, seeing none, bring I it will ahead. move. Why not? <laughs> to uh, waive the second reading and read by title only and adopt ordinance number 792, an ordinance of the town council of the town of Fairfax amending chapter 10.04 of the town code uniform traffic ordinance adopted to allow overnight parking in downtown by town council resolution. A second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, <laughs> moving on to Item 29. Garrett, would you like to do a quick <laughs> Great. report? Great. Item 29 actually is a direct reference to the ordinance you just adopted. This is a resolution allowing uh, overnight parking on Center Boulevard between Pacheco and Pastore. That was in response to the issues when we were talking about permit parking in the Inyo neighborhood. At that time, the council indicated it would like to allow overnight parking on Center Boulevard, but in order to do so, we had to modify the ordinance, which you've just done. So 30 days from now, uh, this resolution can, would be in effect and then you can allow overnight parking in the designated area. Okay, um, I guess there's no public comment because there's no one here. So I'd like to see if there are any uh, questions of the council or if somebody would like to make a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion and to to adopt a resolution to allow overnight parking on Center Boulevard between Pacheco and Pastoria Avenues. Uh, would anyone like to second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we are moving very quickly. It's sausage. <laughs> um, sausage. Agenda item 30. Garrett, would you like to do a quick uh, staff sure. report? This is the second reading of an ordinance that updates the procedure for direct referrals by council. In essence, the change just makes it the council doesn't have to actually list a reason for the directed referral. Um, it'll take effect 30 days from the second reading. All right, um, well, there's no public comment, so I'll see. Move, move uh, to waive second reading, read by title only, and adopt ordinance 793, one of our ordinances, um, town code amending 17.036, to update the procedure for directed okay, referrals by the town council. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Um, and I'm going to adjourn the meeting in memory of Elaine Gale Childress Grant. She passed away way too soon of breast cancer um, in the last few weeks. So um, she made many, um, many contributions, uh, Manor School and other schools, and I know some of our council members and our town clerk's children were taught by her and assisted by her, so sad news. So with that, adjourn. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>